in the light of day, a men of fire beach romantic suspense, written by Lorena Hooks, copyright 2023, narrated by Lorena Hooks, audio copyright 2023. Chapter 1. Deacon. Deacon Jackson stared down at the unknown number flashing on his screen. He rarely answered his phone when he was out with friends unless it was an emergency from work. He liked being in the moment and not being tethered to a device that could find him anywhere. In fact, he would leave the device home if he could, but being a fireman meant he needed to be reachable in case there was an emergency. However, emergencies didn't come from unknown numbers. He should just ignore the ringing and shove the phone back in his pocket. But something stopped him. Something told him that he needed to answer this call. His heart sped up in his chest and he glanced around. No one was watching him. After all, he was not the guest of honor. That title belonged to Luca, who was about to propose to Ivy and Deacon didn't want to miss it. But he couldn't dismiss the call, either. He pressed his lips together and stared at the ringing phone, his knuckles whitening as he tightened his grip on the receiver. After a few seconds of uncertainty, he grabbed his coat and slipped quietly out of the door as he brought the phone to his ear. Hello, he said. There was a soft intake of breath, and then a silence that lasted so long, Deacon wondered if the caller had hung up. Hello, he said again. Deacon, is this Deacon Jackson? Deacon's knees buckled, and he placed a hand against the restaurant wall to keep from collapsing. He hadn't heard this voice in years, eight years to be exact, and he never thought he'd hear it again. Not since that horrible, fateful day that changed the trajectory of his life forever. Eight years was a long time, enough for her to have grown and changed, but her voice didn't sound older or more mature. On the contrary, it sounded timid and meek, scared. Shonda? A sigh filled with relief tickled his ears. Yes, I'm so glad you remember me. I know it's been years and we agreed not to communicate, but I don't know who to trust, Deacon. Memories that he'd locked behind a heavy door suddenly flooded his mind. Shonda Turner, the only woman he'd ever loved. The woman he'd thought he was going to marry until... He pushed the thought away. That one was too painful and he wouldn't let it play. It's fine that you called me, but what's wrong? But was it fine, really? She'd interrupted his night, and it had been eight years. Plus, if he remembered correctly, she was the one who'd pushed him away. Although he couldn't really fault her for that after what he did. I think someone is out to get me. Whoa, back up. Why would someone be out to get you? The last he knew, Shonda had been training to be a nurse. And nurses weren't high on the list for people to go after. I don't want to talk about it over the phone. Let's just say that I saw something I shouldn't have and then told the wrong people. They all think I'm crazy, and even though I don't feel like it, maybe I am. Deacon could hear the strain of frustration in her voice. I don't think you're crazy. Neither do I, which is why I need someone who knows me, the me before all this started happening. I need to talk to someone I can trust. It's a lot to ask, I know, but I need you. Can you get away for a few days? Deacon pressed his lips together as he thought. He had spent so long trying to forget her, trying to erase the memories of their past, the guilt from his past, Shonda represented everything he had tried to move on from, every bad habit he had left behind. But she had also once been the woman he loved. Could he really deny her now? I don't know if I can get the time off. That 
wasn't entirely true, but without asking the captain, he certainly didn't know he could get the time off. There was a pause that stretched long enough that Deacon held the phone out to make sure he hadn't lost connection. Please try. I'll explain everything, but I don't know if it's safe to say over the phone. Not safe over the phone? What exactly was she dealing with? And did he really want to get involved? Against his better judgment, he found himself agreeing. Okay, let me check with the chief and I'll see if I can get some time off. It's going to be all right, Shonda. I hope so. Thanks, Deacon, for everything. He wasn't exactly sure what that meant. You're welcome. I'll see you soon. He ended the call and stared at the phone for a moment, trying to piece together exactly what was going on with Shonda. Sure, she hadn't been in the best place the last time he'd seen her, but neither had he. He supposed making the kind of decision they had could do that to people, something no one ever talked about. His mind started to drift back to that fateful day again, but he shook his head. There was no use opening that door. Not anymore. Hey, there you are. Everything okay? Deacon's gaze darted up to Luca. His kind brown eyes searched Deacon's face for answers. Swallowing hard, Deacon glanced down at the phone in his hand, heavy with the weight of the unknown. I... I don't know, he stammered. I just got a phone call that I wasn't expecting. Luca scrutinized him, his right eyebrow lifting ever so slightly. Was it from a ghost? Because you don't look so good. His voice was filled with a mix of uncertainty and concern, and it created an odd contrast with his large frame. Deacon shook his head and exhaled slowly, trying to find the right words. No, it was definitely not from a ghost, at least not an actual ghost. It was from someone I never expected to hear from again. Luca tilted his head, his eyes lighting with interest. Well, then why don't you come back inside and tell me all about it? Deacon closed his eyes and heaved a sigh, the weight of the moment heavy on his shoulders. I don't want to put a damper on this night. This is all about you and Ivy. Did I miss it? Did you pop the question? His voice was barely above a whisper. Luca chuckled. Yeah, but don't worry about it, and don't even think about not sharing. We're family, and everyone in there is going to want to know about what's going on with you. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. We're brothers, right? Right. The two of them might not have been related by blood, but Luca really was like family to him. Deacon had lost touch with most of his biological family over the years. Well, they'd pretty much stopped talking to him when he returned to God and started living a life for him, and the men at the firehouse had become like his brothers. He supposed he could tell them a little, but maybe not everything. Not yet. Okay, let's go. That's the spirit, Luca said as he clapped a hand on Deacon's shoulder and led him back inside. Because the rest of the group was still loud and celebratory, Deacon and Luca headed toward the back of the restaurant and slid into a booth. The soft leather seat cushioned them from the hard wooden bench, and though it was not silent, it was quiet enough. Luca folded his hands together and leaned forward. Okay, now tell me what's going on. Deacon opened his mouth to speak, but before he could, Ivy appeared at the end of the booth. There you are. Where'd you go? The question was addressed to Luca, but her eyes shifted to Deacon as if she sensed something important was going on. Is everything okay? Deacon was just about to tell me what's going on. Have a seat. Luca shifted and patted the seat beside him and Ivy slid in next to him. Deacon hesitated as a wave of uncertainty washed over him. He wanted to keep the night positive and ignore his past, but he also knew that if he refused, Luca would pester him until he gave in. 
He sighed heavily and reluctantly began to tell them his story, at least as much as he knew. I don't really know what's going on. I just got a call from someone I haven't talked to in nearly a decade. She wouldn't tell me what the problem was over the phone, just asked me to come. Ivy's brows lifted. She? Is there romance involved in this past? Deacon took a deep breath and rubbed his hand across his chin. There was, but it was a long time ago. A beautiful woman with dark, almost black hair and eyes appeared in his mind. She'd been so young then. Well, they both had been, but he did wonder if she'd look the same now. So I guess I'm confused, Lucas said, his words slow and drawn out. Why is she reaching out to you if you haven't spoken in so long? Deacon shrugged. She says she's in trouble, and I'm the only one she trusts. Why you? Ivy grimaced and shook her head. Sorry, that didn't come out right. I mean, why is she calling you? Shouldn't she be calling the police? I don't think she trusts the police for whatever reason. And maybe she thinks I can help because I used to be a cop. Across the table, both Ivy's and Luca's jaws dropped, but Ivy recovered her voice first. You were a cop? Deacon sighed and nodded. Yes, I was, a long time ago. Luca leaned forward. That's incredible. Why did you leave? Surely you weren't forced out. Deacon waved his hand as if to dismiss the question. No, nothing like that. I went through a hard time after Shonda and I broke up. A hard time didn't really begin to cover it, but he wasn't ready to share the rest of that story yet. It was still too painful, even after all these years. Ivy's gaze softened as she studied him with understanding eyes. You're going to go, right? I mean, you can't not go when she reaches out to you after so long. Luca nodded in agreement. If she thinks you're the only one she can trust, you should probably go check on her and see what kind of trouble she is in. He looked at Deacon intently and waited for a response. Deacon knew they were right. There was no way his conscience would let him ignore her plea, even though he knew it could end up being emotional for both of them. Still, he owed her at least this much. He couldn't turn away someone who needed help when they trusted him the most. Yeah, he said finally, with a deep breath of resolve. I need to clear it with the chief, but I guess I'm going, at least long enough to see what she wants. Why do I feel like there's more to this story than you're letting on? Luca asked, folding his arms across his broad chest. Luca wasn't always the most perceptive, but he was pretty good at spotting cop-outs. There is, but I'm not ready to get into it now. Let me go see what she needs, and I promise I'll tell you everything when I get back. The two exchanged a stare for a moment, and then Luca nodded. Okay, but I'm going to hold you to that. Deacon took a deep breath and sighed. He wasn't exactly hiding his past, but he had hoped he wouldn't have to think about those days again. Too bad that was wishful thinking. Chapter 2 Shonda Shonda chewed on the inside of her lip as she checked her watch again. Deacon had texted her an hour ago with his ETA, and it should have been five minutes ago, but he was late. And the deacon she remembered had never been late. She supposed he could have changed in that time, or... No, she wouldn't let herself think that. There could be no way they'd found out about deacon. She'd been careful. She hadn't called from her house in case it was bugged and she'd gone across town to use her cell in case they were monitoring anything close to her house. So unless they'd bugged her cell phone, she pulled it from her pocket and tossed it onto the couch as if it had burned her. Surely not, but it would explain things. She'd have to get a new phone tomorrow. 
Her eyes dropped to her watch again, ten minutes late now. Without thinking about it, she began pacing across the floor. Dante would be home in a few hours, and Deacon couldn't be here when he got home. She would have to explain eventually, but it was too much for today, for right now. Right now, she needed Deacon focused on helping her before she really did go crazy. A black truck slowed as it approached her house, and then it pulled into the driveway. It wasn't what he'd driven when they'd been together, but it had to be Deacon. Still, she couldn't take any chances. Though she didn't own a gun, she'd found a baseball bat in the garage, and now it sat by the front door. Dante either hadn't noticed or hadn't cared, which was fine with Shonda. Explaining why she felt the need to keep a bat by the front door would be hard. She picked up the bat, enjoying the solid feel of its weight. Though she didn't know if she'd ever actually be able to use it if push came to shove, she liked the way it made her feel safer. Lifting on her toes, she peeked through the peephole of the front door. The door of the truck opened and a man stepped out. He was bigger than she remembered, a wall of solid muscle, but she imagined his demanding job played a large role in that. His face, however, was exactly as she remembered, and she quickly opened the door to usher him in. His gaze washed over her, his eyes widening when he spotted her weapon. Shonda, what's going on? Why do you have a bat? She shook her head, ignoring his questions and motioned for him to come inside. Then she shut the door, put a finger to her lips in a shushing motion, and indicated for him to follow her. With no idea if the place was bugged or not, the only thing she could think to do was take him to her room and turn on the music loudly. Then they could talk quietly and not be heard. She realized she hadn't thought the plan through entirely when he followed her into her bedroom and she was hit with memories of the past. How many times had they shared a bed together? Of course, this time would be different. This time, it would only be so they could hear each other. But it didn't stop her heart from aching a little at the memory. Grabbing the remote, she turned the music on and sat on the bed, patting the seat next to her for Deacon. He looked at her as if she was crazy. Maybe she was. But he sat and then leaned close. What's with the loud music? I don't know if the house is bugged. I don't want them to hear us. Bugged? What exactly are we dealing with, Shonda? She pressed her lips together and shook her head. She'd asked herself the same question several times in the last few weeks, and she still didn't have the answer. I don't know, but someone powerful. Can't we just go outside? I think they listen outside, too. I'm just not sure how far. Well, my truck's not bugged. Come on, we'll drive somewhere and then talk in the truck. I can't think with the music this loud. Of course. Why hadn't she thought of that? Probably because she hadn't slept well the last few weeks. She was running on adrenaline, the need to keep Dante safe and a prayer. With a nod, she followed him back down the stairs, not bothering to turn off the music. Hopefully, they would think she was still in the house. She followed Deacon out the front door, locking it behind her and glancing at her watch as she did. They should still have time before Dante returned home. She'd just have to be careful to watch the time. A sudden breeze whipped around her and she tucked her chin down low, burying it in the collar of her jacket to keep from shivering. Deacon opened the door for her and helped her inside, and the smell of him hit her like a wall. It was strong in his truck, and it was the same scent that haunted her dreams. The same scent he wore eight years ago. He'd changed, but not everything. He shut her door and then climbed in the driver's side, still saying nothing. Then he pulled out and headed toward downtown. She wanted to ask him where he was going, but she wasn't sure it was safe yet. 
However, when he pulled into the parking lot of the police station, she shook her head. Not here. Let's go to our spot. She wasn't sure he would remember, but after a moment he nodded and headed toward the park they used to hang out at. It had been so long since she'd been there that she was pretty sure whomever was after her wouldn't know about it. Deacon parked and turned off the engine before shifting in his seat to face her. Okay, now spill. Shonda took a few deep breaths as she tried to put the words she wanted to say in order in her head. A few weeks ago, I saw what I think was a fentanyl exchange. I reported it to the police, but I guess whoever I saw is related to someone very important. They assured me I'd seen it wrong, but I knew I was right, so I didn't let up. Unfortunately, they decided to use my conviction against me and claim that I was having mental health issues. My job ordered me to visit a therapist, and while I didn't need one, I figured it couldn't hurt to tell more people. But then things started happening. Deacon appeared to be listening intently, his face stoic and his eyes fixed on her. What kind of things? he asked. His truck was big, but he made the space seem small and yet somehow safe. At first, it was little things like my keys not being in the place I normally put them or light switches being on that I was sure I turned off. Then I started having blank spots in my memory. Like every once in a while, it would just be black as if whatever had been there was gone. Did you tell your therapist? Shonda nodded and chewed on her bottom lip. I did with the first stuff, the forgetful pieces, but then I started to get a weird feeling about the way he reacted, so I haven't shared anything else. What do you mean? How did he react? Shonda paused as she tried to think of exactly how to explain it. It was more of a feeling, really. When I told him about the keys and lights, he seemed too interested, almost excited. But that's crazy, right? Deacon rubbed a hand across his chin. Do you have reason to mistrust him? You mean other than his weird interest? Yeah, a few. The first being that nothing happened until I started seeing him. Lines of confusion wrinkled Deacon's brow. So why don't you just quit seeing him and find another therapist if your job insists on it? That's reason number two, she said with a sigh. When I went to my HR rep and told them I'd like to see a new therapist, they told me he was the only one approved to handle my case. Okay, that does sound fishy, Deacon said slowly. Right? I mean, perhaps she meant that he was the only one the company contracts with, but we're a decent-sized hospital. I find it hard to believe we only contract with one therapist. Deacon tilted his head and studied her. You work at a hospital, so you finished nursing school? Shonda pressed her lips together, wondering how much of her life she should share. But he would find out eventually. If she really wanted his help, she'd have to be honest with him. I did. His lips pulled into a soft smile. I can see that. You were always so driven and caring. ER? Um, no. Pediatrics. She had no idea how he would respond to that and forced herself not to share more. His expression shifted. Pediatrics? Isn't that hard after... He let the words trail off, but she knew what he meant. She should tell him now. It was the perfect opportunity, and he deserved to know. But the words wouldn't come. Instead, she shook her head. It's not that hard. I love kids. He shifted his eyes away from her then and stared out the windshield for a moment. You always did. Then he sighed and turned back to her. So why am I here? What exactly do you think I can do? 
Ah, yes, that was the same question she'd been asking herself since she called him. Why had she called him, of all people? But she knew the answer to the question, even if she wasn't ready to say it out loud. I don't know exactly. I needed to talk to someone I could trust, and even though it's been years, I still trust you. I'm not sure who to trust here because I think at least some people in the police department are trying to cover this up. Beyond that, I guess I was hoping that maybe you could help me investigate or at least give me advice about what to do. I'm not a cop anymore, Shonda. I know, but you were, so you have a better idea of how to handle this than I do. Look, I just feel like I'm going crazy. Like they're trying to make me go crazy, but I don't know how to prove it. I can't just sit back and wait for it to get worse. What if they come after me? Will you help me? It was a lot to ask. Not only did she not know exactly what she needed, but it had been years since they'd been close. Years of separation and a shared heartache was hard to overcome. Deacon stared at her, and she could almost see the wheels turning in his head. I don't have any jurisdiction here, so I can't investigate the crime you saw, but I might still have some friends on the force. Maybe I can meet with them and find out what they know. As for the therapist, that does give me pause. Perhaps I can come with you to an appointment and meet him and see where to go from there? It was more than Shonda had hoped for, and she resisted the urge to throw her arms around him, settling instead for placing her hand on his arm. Thank you, Deacon. His gaze dropped to her hand and heat erupted under her fingertips. Don't thank me yet. I haven't done anything. She returned her hand to her lap and nodded, but he was wrong. He'd already done so much for her. He just didn't know it yet. Chapter 3 Deacon Deacon struggled to push the memories of Shonda from his mind. Her eyes were so full of fear that he longed to pull her into his arms again and tell her everything would be okay. But they didn't have that relationship anymore. You ready to go back then? She nodded and then pressed her lips together. I know I asked you to come, but you can't stay at the house. I'll help pay for a hotel room, though. He shook his head. Don't worry about it. I didn't expect to stay with you. I don't think that would be good for either of us. Thank you for understanding. Her eyes dropped to her lap, and silence filled the cab of the truck for a moment before she looked up again. Her eyes were like dying embers covered with a layer of soot, heartbroken as if she'd cried out her soul and had nothing left, or as if she'd locked it away so she couldn't feel it. You don't think I'm crazy, do you? She looked so weary, so broken. There was no doubt in his mind that something was going on. Shonda had always been fashionable, not obsessed, but aware of style and what looked best on her. Her dark hair, which had always been stylish, now looked flat and lifeless, and her eyelids had bags under them as if she hadn't slept in days. He didn't know what was going on, but he definitely didn't believe she was crazy. No, I don't think you're crazy. I just hope I can help. The ride back to her house was quiet, but it gave him time to think. He felt like a fish out of water. It had been so long since he'd been a cop that it felt like a lifetime ago, and he wasn't sure where to start. He dropped Shonda off and then drove to the hotel where he'd reserved a room. As he drove, he rehashed Shonda's words over and over. There were steps he knew he needed to take and some he wouldn't be able to do on his own, but he was worried about the other steps the ones he didn't know about. Thankfully, he knew there was someone he could call who could fill him in. He pulled into the hotel parking lot, checked in at the tiny lobby, and then made his way to his room. 
It was basic, but it contained everything he would need. A bed, a small closet area, dresser, table, and bathroom. Though not visually stimulating, it appeared clean, and it even had a small refrigerator, though he doubted he'd be using it much, as he had no way to cook. Tossing his bag on the hotel bed, he fished his phone out of his pocket and dialed Detective Jordan Graves. He'd only known Jordan the last year or so, but Deacon trusted him completely. Detective Graves, Jordan said after the second ring. Jordan, it's Deacon. I need your help. He filled Jordan in on the situation, what little he knew of it, and waited for Jordan's response. Is there anyone in the department there that you trust? I'm not sure. I didn't really keep in touch with anyone here but there are a few names I could check to see if they're still on. They were good men back then, but it's been years, so even if they are still here, I'm not sure if I can trust them. Jordan sighed on the other end, and Deacon pictured him scratching at the stubble on his face. It was something he often did when he was thinking. Okay, my first advice is meet with whomever you know. Test them and see if you can trust them. Second, go to the local electronic or hardware store and pick up a hidden camera and bug detector and an audio jammer. They won't be as good as the police use, but unless you're dealing with a super high-tech criminal, they should suffice. Use the audio jammer whenever you talk in her house, even if you find no bugs. That should help to jam anything they might have and keep them from hearing you. Deacon listened intently as Jordan explained how best to go about gathering information while also eluding anyone who might be trying to listen in. Okay, that's what I thought. How about the therapist? Is there a way to check him out? If you give me his name, I'll see what I can do. Otherwise, see if you can play the estranged husband who's back in the picture card. If you aren't married, I don't think the therapist has to let you in. Even if you are, I don't guarantee he will, but you'll have more pull. Fake marriage. Deacon chuckled softly, thinking back to how close they had come to really getting married. We can probably do that, unless he asks for proof. If he does, let me know. I know a hacker who might be able to help. At that, Deacon's brow lifted. You know a hacker? I know a lot of people most would find unsavory. It kind of goes with the job. This one happens to be a CI for us, so they use their talents for good now. Got it. What about protection? Do you think she's in danger? Deacon shook his head, though he knew that Jordan couldn't see it. I honestly don't know. It just seems odd that if she did see a crime and reported it, they wouldn't try to go after her. Yeah, keep an eye out. Watch for suspicious cars, ones that stay parked near her for a long time, or have super dark tinting on the windows. Otherwise, I guess try to accompany her whenever you can. I know you're not a cop anymore, but hopefully you remember some of the training. Yeah. He actually remembered a lot of the training. Plus, firefighters went through a similar, though less specific, training. Still, he couldn't help wishing he was still licensed to carry his firearm. Can I call you if anything else comes up? Of course. And Deacon? Yeah? Stay safe. If she really did witness a crime that's being covered up, this might get dangerous quickly. Got it. Deacon ended the call, unpacked the few items he'd brought, and then headed out to find the gadgets and some food. The town had changed since he'd last been there, but not by much. Some shops he remembered were gone, including the ice cream shop he'd loved to stop in after a hard day of work. That was probably for the best. Ice cream wasn't on his meal plan much anymore. The old dollar theater was also gone, replaced by a discount store, and a few new shops had moved in. A liquor store, a smoke shop, and a furniture store he didn't remember. He wondered how the crime in the city was now. Liquor and tobacco didn't always mean more crime, but there was a decent correlation. He stopped in the electronics store first. It was one of those big chain stores, and he wasn't sure he was going to be able to find what he needed. 
But nestled at the very back among webcams, he found the camera and bug detector. The audio jammer was on the other side of the store, with the few remaining CB radios and boom boxes. It was odd how quickly some things went out of fashion. He remembered boom boxes being all the rage when he was younger, but CD players and then iPods quickly made them obsolete. Now, even those two things were hard to find as most people just use their phones to listen to music. He handed his items to the checker and watched as the young man lifted an eyebrow. These are interesting purchases. Don't see them every day. The checker didn't even look old enough to be out of high school. And though he didn't say it, Deacon got the sense that the checker thought he was some kind of pervert. That was a perception he definitely wanted to clear up. Yeah, well, when you're staying in hotels, you can never be too careful. I watched a show the other night about a woman finding a hidden camera behind the mirror in her hotel room. The cashier's eyes widened and his demeanor instantly shifted. Oh man, you're right. I saw that one too. He shook his head as he rang up the purchases. Crazy, right? It's a crazy world, Deacon said, as he handed over the money and took the bag. A crazy world indeed. What were the odds that he would end up back here, that Shonda would need his help? He thanked the cashier and headed to his car, stashing the items under the seat. He doubted anyone was following him, but he had no idea what kind of eyes might be on Shonda. His stomach rumbled as he started the truck, and he pointed it toward his favorite diner, hoping the place would still be there. A tiny smile tugged on the corners of his lips as he pulled into the parking lot. Mama's was still standing, though the near-empty parking lot didn't bode well for their future. As he opened the front door, he was hit with a wave of nostalgia. Music filled the air from the ancient jukebox in the corner, and though the decorations were faded and yellowed, they were the same 50s-themed ones he remembered. Mama's had been one of his favorite places because the woman who owned it had decided that home cooking was the way to go. She grew almost all her own ingredients and everything was made daily or sourced from other local grocers. He'd even tried to recreate some of his favorite meals, but they never turned out quite as good as Mama's. Just one tonight? The hostess, a young girl with her blonde hair pulled back into a high pony, asked as he approached the stand. Though she smiled, it didn't quite reach her eyes, and he wondered if it was just the fatigue of a long shift or the worry over lack of customers that affected her. He nodded and followed her to a small table in the corner. Taking a seat, he breathed in the nostalgia from years past. It was strange being here without Shonda, but he had to admit that it was nice to be back. He picked up the menu, which looked old and faded. If it wasn't the same one from nearly a decade ago, it was certainly close. Scanning the offerings, he decided on the chicken fried steak with mashed potatoes and green beans. It was a heavier meal than he usually ate for dinner, but it was also comforting and hearty and he could definitely use that right now. A few minutes later, the waitress brought out his meal and set it down before him without a word. He thanked her and began to eat, savoring the flavors of home-cooked food. The restaurant wasn't crowded, and other than the music, it was quiet. Deacon sat alone with his thoughts for most of the meal. As he finished up and reached for his wallet, he noticed an old man across the room watching him intently, when their eyes met, Deacon smiled, but the old man just stared at him before turning away again. Deacon frowned as he paid his bill and left the diner. Who was that man, and why had he been staring? Was he a regular who was staring simply because he didn't recognize Deacon? Or could he have followed Deacon from Shonda's? He hadn't seen anyone following him, but he couldn't remember if the man had been there when he entered the restaurant or not. He shook his head to clear the questions. Now he was sounding paranoid, and he had to keep a clear head. Shonda's safety might depend on it. Chapter 4 Shonda 
Shonda glanced at her watch as she put the dishes in the sink and sighed. They were running late again. Ever since she'd been forced to attend therapy sessions, she just couldn't seem to get up on time. It was like a fog hovered in her brain every morning. And while a cup of coffee used to clear that feeling, now it lasted until lunchtime, sometimes later. He had to be doing something to her. But what? Dante, let's go. Her son came thundering down the stairs. Though he was eight, he was small for his age and was often mistaken for a much younger six years of age, at least until he spoke. He'd always been a sagacious child, and he'd spoken clearly at a young age. Shonda liked to think it was because she'd taken the time to read to him every night, but she couldn't discount the fact that his father was an intelligent man, and some of that might have come from him. I'm ready, Mom. He grabbed the lunch she'd packed for him and hoisted his bag higher on his little shoulder. Though only in second grade, his bag always seemed full and looked bigger than he did. She wondered how much worse it would be when he hit middle school or high school. Okay, let's go. She shoved her phone in her purse and grabbed her keys as she led the way to the front door. As she often did now, she glanced through the peephole before opening it. She didn't know exactly why, as she had no idea what to be looking for, but at least no one was on the porch. She scanned the streets as she stepped outside, but they were quiet as well. Nor did her mirrors show anyone following her as she drove to Dante's school. But that did not ease her frayed nerves as she pulled into the drop-off area. She did her best to hide her anxiety from him, but the worry still felt palpable as she said goodbye. He had to go to school, and she had to go to work. But she hated this time of day when she couldn't make sure he was safe. She wished that she could just stay with him and protect him, but that wasn't her reality at the moment. She waved goodbye to him, trying to keep her fear in check, and continued on to the hospital. Deacon would come over again this afternoon. He'd assured her he had a way to check for bugs. And while that was just a start, it was something. Her bigger fear was what to do about the therapist. But that could come later. Shonda slowed as she pulled into the parking lot of the hospital. There were police cars parked outside with their lights flashing. Something was wrong. She rushed inside, finding people in disarray and chaos. What happened? She asked the first woman who ran past her, an ER nurse she recognized but didn't know well. There was a shooting. It's mayhem down here. Her eyes dropped to Shonda's badge. If you're not needed up there, we could use more hands. Then she hurried away. A shooting? It was unlikely that Dante was involved. After all, she'd just dropped him off at school, and she hadn't heard any gunfire. But it was possible, wasn't it? Disasters had happened in shorter periods of time, hadn't they? Shonda stumbled to the nearest nurse's station, trying desperately to make sense of the situation. The shooting. It wasn't a school, was it? The nurse shook her head. No, someone stumbled in off the street, but several employees were hit. I'll see if I can help, Shonda said, before hurrying toward the elevator. Trauma was not her specialty, but now that she knew Dante was safe, she could recall some of that training from years ago. The elevator door opened to the colorful pediatric floor, and Shonda went in search of her boss. Oh, there you are, her boss Aaron said as she approached. Aaron was older than Shonda by a good 30 years. Her hair was nearly all gray, and though it was clear she had a skincare regime, wrinkles still creased her kind face. But as far as Shonda was concerned, it only added to her grandmotherly appearance. Aaron exuded warmth like a well-worn sweater, and the kids loved her. Sorry, I stopped to see what the commotion was about. If you can spare me, it seems they could use more hands downstairs. Aaron smiled. 
I was going to tell you the same thing. But grab your pager in case I need you. We have a light load today, but you never know when it might change. Shonda nodded, dropped her stuff in her locker, and headed back downstairs. She was not mentally prepared for what she walked into, but once she fell into the routine of bandaging wounds and monitoring pain medication, the hours flew by. When her stomach rumbled, reminding her it was lunchtime, she looked down at her watch, surprised by how much time had passed. She'd have just enough time to make it home before Deacon arrived, if she hurried. Deacon's truck was already in the drive when she pulled in, but he must have arrived early. The clock showed she was only a minute late. She parked beside him and stepped out, apologizing as she did. So sorry, she said when Deacon opened his door. There was an incident at the hospital. Is everyone okay? He asked, following her inside. Sadly, no. A person with mental health issues wandered in off the street and went on a shooting spree. He ended up hitting three nurses and two doctors before the police took him down. One didn't make it and two were in surgery. Deacon's eyes filled with compassion. I'm so sorry, Shonda. That's got to be hard. It is, but it's the life I chose. However, losing a patient is never easy. No, I guess it wouldn't be. His voice sounded different, and Shonda glanced over to see what was wrong. But he wasn't looking at anything in particular. Instead, he seemed to be lost in thought. And Shonda wondered if he was thinking of that fateful day eight years ago. She should tell him. He deserved to know. And now that she knew he was sober and settled, she had no reason to keep it from him any longer. But she couldn't make the words spill from her mouth. So she did the cowardly thing and changed the subject. Well, shall we get started? Right, of course. Deacon shook his head and pulled out a small black box with a knob on top. He fiddled with it for a second and then nodded. Okay, we should be good. Even if there are bugs, this should jam the communication. Then he pulled out another black device, only this one had an antenna-looking thing on it. Let's sweep. Shonda felt a little subconscious letting Deacon wander around her house. But removing bugs, or knowing that there were none to begin with, made her feel better at least until he opened Dante's door and froze. She'd meant to prep him, to tell him she had a son, but the right words had just never come. He turned to her, but it was slow, as if the motion itself took energy out of him. What is this? This is my son's room. I'm sorry, I meant to tell you sooner, but... She shrugged letting the rest of the sentence remain unfinished. He would understand. Their shared past would guarantee that. You have a son. He stated it like a fact, but she could hear the questions he didn't ask. How old was her son? How long did she wait after their breakup to move on to someone new? Why wasn't she ready to have a son with him? I do. His name is Dante. Here was another opening, but she still couldn't do it. She couldn't force the truthful words out of her mouth. Deacon nodded and then stepped into the room, scanning it with the device like he had every other room. He said nothing more about her son, but Shonda knew he would. She could almost see the processing going on in his mind. After Dante's room, they hit the bathroom and then her bedroom before returning to the living room. It doesn't appear you have bugs, which is good, but I'd leave the jammer on just in case. Shonda wished that made her feel better, but somehow it didn't. She was glad no one was listening to her, but at least if they'd found bugs, she could prove she wasn't crazy. That was less likely now. Will the jammer affect our Wi-Fi? I don't use it that much, but Dante does. Deacon shook his head. No, it won't affect the Wi-Fi. It just creates a white noise for any listening device, so they don't hear anything. You can take it in the car with you as well if you need. 
I'd say work too, but it might interfere with things at the hospital, so I wouldn't take it there. That's all right. I feel protected at the hospital. It was the one place she felt completely safe, except for when she'd been called into HR. So what now? Deacon ran a hand across the back of his neck and sighed. I think the next step is for me to go with you to the therapist. I don't like that all of this started after you began seeing him. When is your next appointment? Tomorrow at 1 p.m. Okay, I'll meet you here at noon and we'll go together. If something is going on with your therapist, Shonda, are you prepared to stop seeing him, even if it means losing your job? Shonda chewed on her bottom lip. Was she prepared for that? She loved her job, and if she didn't have her job, how would she provide for Dante? Still, she couldn't shake the feeling that things were only going to get worse, and protecting Dante was more important than her job. She would hate to leave, to start over, but if it meant that she and her son were alive, then it would be worth it. Yeah, I don't know what I'd do, but protecting Dante is the most important thing. Deacon nodded and glanced back toward Dante's room. He had questions, and she would have to tell him sooner or later. But she wasn't ready yet. Not just yet. Chapter 5 Deacon He didn't think Shonda was crazy, but he was starting to wonder if he was. Yes, it had only been a little over 24 hours since he'd arrived, but there were no bugs in her house, at least not ones picked up by his machine, and so far he'd been unable to see anyone watching the house. As much as he hoped her therapist wasn't messing with her somehow, Deacon needed to find a reason to stay, because so far he didn't have one. Other than her son, Deacon was definitely curious about him. How old was the boy? How long had she waited after breaking up with Deacon to find someone new? And why was she ready to have a child then and not with him? Well, he couldn't put that decision solely on her shoulders. He'd been the one to suggest the procedure, claiming he was too busy with his new position to deal with a baby at the moment. Procedure. He shook his head as he grabbed his coat. That made it sound like it was getting a mole removed or a teeth pulled out, not a defining decision that would alter the trajectory of his life so profoundly. No one ever talked about that part. So yeah, he was curious to meet Dante. But then what? Shonda's life didn't seem to be in danger, but she certainly believed it was, and he believed her. He supposed if the therapist was a bust, he would see if any of his old friends were still on the force. They might not be able to help, but maybe they would at least know if a cover-up was happening. And if it was, what then? Did he whisk Shonda away somewhere and give her a new life? Did he bring in outside help? He just didn't know, and he hated not knowing. God, I could really use some wisdom. He'd prayed last night, but even though he'd sat for nearly half an hour waiting for some word, some nudge? Nothing had come, but he wouldn't quit asking. He knew God had perfect timing, and sometimes he waited to make the way clear. Deacon patted his pockets to make sure he had both his wallet and his keycard, and then he headed over to Shonda's place. Though he'd yet to see anything suspicious, he divided his attention between the road and the mirrors, but the drive was uneventful. As soon as he pulled into the driveway, the door opened and Shonda hurried out. Thanks for driving, she said as she climbed in the passenger seat. No problem, just tell me where we're going. She gave him directions and soon he was pulling into the parking lot of a prestigious glass building. This is your therapist's office? He had no doubt therapists made money, but this seemed a little over the top especially for one paid by an employer. Right? We have subpar health and dental insurance, but we can afford a therapist who has an office here? I'm glad you see it too. 
It does seem a little odd, he agreed. But maybe he gets some sort of deal on the rent. Yeah, maybe. So what's the story here? How do I explain you? I'm assuming you told him you were single, so let's go with we are separated but considering reconciliation. You wanted me to meet him so that maybe I would consider counseling. Shonda nodded. That sounds good and believable. What if he won't let you in, though? Then I'll sit and wait in the lobby. Don't worry, I'm not leaving you here alone. She took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. Okay, let's do this. Though it felt a little unnatural after so long, Deacon took her hand as they entered the building. If they were going to pretend to be reconciling, they needed to look the part. He pulled open the front door, his eyes widening at the giant open concept foyer. A large desk was in the center, but the only other furniture was a few tables grouped together on the right side. He couldn't imagine the purpose, though. It would be way too loud to host a meeting. He's on the third floor, Shonda whispered, leading the way to a glass elevator. Deacon rarely felt uncomfortable, but the sheer amount of glass in this building gave him the feeling of a bug under a microscope or the eye of Big Brother. They rode up in silence, but Shonda's tight grip on his hand conveyed her nervousness. His own heart pounded a little faster than normal in his chest, but his job required him to keep his calm in all situations, so he was confident in his ability to appear nonchalant. When the door opened, Shonda led the way to the therapist's office. The floor had carpet, but it was so soft that his feet sank into it without a sound, and it was such a light cream color that it felt invisible. She stopped outside of an ornate door with black lettering that read simply, Dr. Nelson. You ready? She asked, her voice quiet and strained. As I can be. Deacon had no idea what he was walking into, but he took a deep breath and followed her inside. There was a noticeable shift in the air as soon as they entered the office. It felt thicker, heavier, not quite evil, but malignant, maybe. Definitely off, and he could tell that Shonda felt it too. Though she'd been nervous before, she fidgeted more now, her hands clutching her purse tightly or touching the ends of her hair. Deacon tried not to exhibit his own unease as he scanned the room. A man, his face shrouded by a hood pulled low over his eyes, sat in the corner. He seemed to be watching them, and something about him felt familiar, but Deacon couldn't place what exactly. A soft bell chirped, signaling their arrival had been noticed. Then the door that he assumed led to the inner office opened, and a woman exited. She was a beautiful woman, at least in the classical sense. Blonde, petite, and dressed like a million bucks. But her face was etched with hard lines and a look of discontent, or perhaps judgment. However, as soon as she saw them, it was like a switch was flipped. Her lips pulled into a wide smile as she motioned them over to the desk that filled the right side of the room. Well, hello, Shonda. It's so good to see you again. I'll let the doctor know you're here. Her voice was cheerful, almost to the point of dripping with it. But when her eyes shifted to Deacon, he noticed they were still cold. And who may I say this is? I'm her husband. Deacon stepped forward and offered his hand before Shonda could say anything. The woman stared at him, her mouth opened slightly, before tilting her head and turning her focus to Shonda. I don't have any record of you being married. Though the smile was still on her face, it looked strained now, as did the cheerfulness in her voice. We're separated technically, so I didn't mention anything before, but we've been talking and we're trying to reconcile. She placed a hand on his arm and smiled up at him. Though he knew it was only for show, Deacon could not keep his gaze from her hand on his skin, nor could he keep his body from reacting to her touch. 
The woman's eyebrows lifted, and her cheeks sank in as if she was working hard to keep from saying what was really on her mind. I see. Well, I'll let the doctor decide what to do with this situation. Follow me. Deacon glanced back toward the man in the waiting room, who looked as if he hadn't moved. Why wasn't he being seen first? Maybe he was just waiting on someone, or maybe he'd arrived early for his appointment. But something about him didn't sit well. He didn't have time to consider the man further, though, as he followed Shonda and the receptionist into a room. The walls were bathed in tones of midnight blue and dusky gray. The furniture, simple yet tasteful, Soft music drifted from hidden speakers as they waited in silence. The room was clearly decorated to be peaceful and tranquil, but that was not the feeling creeping in on Deacon. It seemed too peaceful, too perfect. The woman looked at them once more before stepping out of the room. The door closed behind her with a soft click. Shonda began to pace the small room, her hands curling into fists and then relaxing. Evidently, she felt it too, whatever was floating in the air in this room. Deacon stepped closer to her, hoping to be a reassuring presence in the face of the unknown. Are your sessions always in this room? He asked. Shonda nodded. I think he has other rooms, but I've only seen this one. The first day I was just nervous, but now it feels... She shuddered and ran her hands up and down her arms. Ominous? Does that sound crazy? Deacon shook his head. No, there's definitely a feeling here. I just wish I knew what it was. A knock sounded on the door, and then a man stepped through. He was a tall, distinguished-looking man in a tailored suit, a pair of reading glasses hanging from a gold chain around his neck. Nothing about him seemed sinister, and yet something seemed off. He stopped at the sight of Deacon. I'm sorry, these are closed sessions. Who are you? Deacon stepped forward, extending his hand. I'm Shonda's husband. The doctor turned a questioning gaze on Shonda. I understood you were single. Shonda swallowed and stepped closer to Deacon. We're separated, but working on reconciling. The doctor's thin lips pressed together, and one eyebrow lifted as if he was trying to determine the validity of Shonda's words. I see. Well, I'm afraid you can't stay. His tone was firm yet gentle. I'm sure you understand. And why is that? Deacon asked. The doctor shrugged and held out his hands, but there was a smarmy look to his expression, like the kind used car salesmen get when they lie about why they can't lower the price. I'm afraid the hospital is only covering private sessions. He turned his attention to Shonda. You do want to keep your job, don't you? Deacon clenched his fists. It was taking every ounce of self-control he had not to punch the man, grab Shonda, and bolt out the door. He didn't want to leave her here with this man. Not alone. There was something very wrong here. But before he could act, Shonda's hand was on his arm again. It's okay, she said softly. You can wait for me outside. I'll be fine. She shot him a pointed look that clearly indicated this was the best option. Maybe the only option. He wanted to protest, to insist that he be allowed in the room or that she leave with him but he didn't. Instead, he nodded and stepped back, his heart heavy with worry. I'll be right outside. Shonda smiled weakly at him before turning her attention back to the doctor. She took a deep breath, as if stealing herself for whatever was to come. The doctor was silent as he watched her, his eyes narrowed thoughtfully. Finally, he nodded and gestured toward the couch. Very well he said, crossing to the door and waiting for Deacon to exit. Let's begin. Deacon stared helplessly as the door closed in front of him, his heart in his throat. He could only hope that everything would be okay. 
Chapter 6 Deacon The lobby was empty when Deacon returned to his seat. He wondered briefly where the hooded man had gone, but figured he must have just been waiting on a ride. Still, why had he seemed familiar? Deacon had only been back for a day, so it was doubtful he'd seen the man in that time. Was he someone from Deacon's past? But it had been years since he'd been here, so surely that wasn't it. The bigger question remained, was he someone Deacon should worry about? Did he have any connection to what was going on with Shonda? With a sigh, Deacon ran his hand across his chin. He wasn't used to having so many questions especially ones that he couldn't answer. Eyes closed, he prayed again for wisdom, and Eric's face filled his mind. Eric had been a friend when he'd been on the force nearly a decade ago, but they'd lost touch when Deacon turned to the bottle. Was God trying to tell him to contact Eric? Could he help? He didn't even know if Eric was still in town, but he supposed it was worth a shot. And unless he was one of the rats, it probably wouldn't hurt to contact him. So Deacon pulled out his phone and scrolled through his contacts until he found the name. He should probably update his contacts. Some of them he barely remembered anymore. Hadn't known them well in his previous life. But every time he had thought about deleting them, something had stopped him. Maybe it had been for this moment, for this purpose. After all, Eric would have been one of those numbers deleted. Deacon marveled again at how God always had an influence in his life, even when he didn't see it at first. Deacon's fingers hovered over the keypad. Should he type this message? Would Eric remember who he was? Or should he call? Although that conversation felt weird in his head as he practiced how it might go. Hey, Eric, it's Deacon. Remember me? No? Well, can you tell me if there's a giant cover-up happening regarding Shonda Turner? Okay, it probably wouldn't go quite that awkwardly, but however he played it out felt wrong. So in the end, he decided on a text, but he kept it vague. If Eric agreed to meet up, he could drop the questions on him in person. Eric, it's Deacon Jackson. Not sure if you remember me, but I'm in town and would love to catch up staying at the Blue Ridge Hotel. With the message sent, Deacon leaned back to wait for Shonda to finish up. She emerged from the room an hour later, but something was off. Her motions were stiff, robotic, and her eyes seemed to stare off into space. Deacon hurried over to her. Shonda, is everything okay? She blinked a few times before turning to meet his eyes. Yeah. Everything is fine. Why? Even her words were slow and stilted. Deacon looked over his shoulder to see the receptionist slash office manager, or whatever she was, watching them. So he pasted on a smile and shook his head. No reason. You ready? He would tell her his concerns later, when eyes he didn't trust weren't watching them. Shonda nodded and Deacon took her arm afraid that she might hurt herself if she wasn't being guided. He had no idea what the doctor had done to her, but this wasn't normal, and he couldn't let her come back here. Shonda said nothing as he led her to the truck. She climbed into the passenger seat with his help as if in a trance. She remained silent the entire drive home as well, though at one point her hand brushed the smooth leather of the seat, and a tiny smile pulled at her lips. Something had definitely been done to her. As he pulled onto her street, he scanned the area for any unknown cars and then parked in the driveway in front of her house. But Shonda made no move to get out. She just stared, her eyes glassy, her face drawn. Deacon put his hand on her arm. Are you all right? Shonda looked down at his hand on her arm, blinked, and slowly shook her head. I don't think so. He reached for her hand and gently pulled her from the car. Come on, he said, leading her to the door. Let's get you inside. Shonda obediently followed him, her feet shuffling on the sidewalk. He opened the door and she crossed over the threshold, one step at a time. 
He followed close behind her, watching her carefully. She seemed to be in a fog, and he wasn't sure he should leave her. She crossed through the living room, then stopped and turned around to face him. Her eyes were wide and her mouth slightly opened. She looked as if she was about to say something, but no words came out. Deacon felt a chill run through him. Something was wrong. He stepped closer to her and said her name softly. Shonda? She just stared at him. She seemed to be looking right through him. Her eyes were unfocused, and he thought he saw a flicker of recognition in them, as if she were trying to remember something, but it was gone as soon as it had appeared. He tried again. Shonda, are you okay? She blinked and nodded slowly. Then she turned away and continued toward the kitchen. He watched her go, feeling a deep sense of unease. There was no way he could leave her like this. With a start, he realized there were plenty of sharp objects that she could hurt herself with in the kitchen. He quickly followed her, his heart pounding in his chest. But she wasn't holding a knife when he entered. In fact, she wasn't doing anything but staring at the countertop. I feel like I was going to do something, she said, looking up at him. But I can't remember what. Deacon stepped closer and took her hand. Do you remember anything from the therapist's office? She tilted her head. The therapist. Her brow furrowed. He didn't like that you were there. Yeah, I gathered that. But did anything happen? Did he give you something to eat or drink? Shonda shook her head. I don't think so. It's so hazy, though. Her free hand rubbed her forehead. And my head hurts. Why does my head hurt? Deacon dropped her hand and leaned back against the counter, folding his arms across his chest. Well, I don't know for sure, but I have the feeling that he either drugged you or hypnotized you. I'm leaning towards drugs as I've watched a few hypnotisms and never seen anyone so groggy afterwards. Her eyes grew wide. What if it was both? Maybe I was resistant to being hypnotized so he drugged me. I was nervous, so maybe that affects things. It's possible. I don't know much about how it works, but I don't think you should go back. She chewed on her bottom lip and nodded. Yeah, you're probably right. Thankfully, the next appointment isn't for another week, but I better figure out what to do about my job, because when I stop going, they might fire me. Hopefully, we'll have this figured out before then, but if not, we'll find you a job at another hospital. Shonda sighed and shook her head. I should have just kept my mouth shut. If I hadn't pushed to get the cops to believe me, maybe this wouldn't be happening. Deacon shook his head. You know that's not true. Fentanyl is killing so many people, we can't just turn a blind eye to it. She sighed and tucked her hair behind her ear. I know, but what good is it if the people who can stop it are corrupt? I have to believe there are some who aren't. While you were with the therapist, I reached out to an old friend on the force, one I trust. We'll see what he says if he responds. Yeah, okay. Shonda nodded, but she didn't look convinced at all. Do you want me to stay? No, that's okay. I'm feeling less foggy now. Plus, I haven't told Dante about you yet. I'd like to do that before he just finds you here. Sure. Just let me know if you need anything. He hesitated, not sure how his next words would be received, but knowing he had to say them. Just don't wait too long to tell Dante what's going on. You don't need to scare him, but he needs to be mindful to watch his surroundings, especially when you're not there. Shonda nodded. I will, and thanks for everything, Deacon. He flashed her a small smile and let himself out of the house, but he couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. Chapter 7 Deacon Deacon was almost back to the hotel when his phone buzzed with a text message alert. He glanced down to see a message from Eric and then pulled over to read it. 
Deacon, so good to hear from you. I'd love to meet up. In fact, I get off in half an hour if you want to grab a coffee at Hill of Beans. Half an hour. He'd get there a little earlier than that, but he could fill his time while he waited. Sounds great. See you there, he typed back, and then pulled back into the stream of traffic. A few minutes later, he pulled into the Hill of Beans coffee shop. The outside looked as if it had seen better days. The paint was worn and chipping. A layer of dirt caked the windows, and the roof appeared to sag in a few places. A faded sign creaked in the wind and had an air of desperation clinging to it, like it was struggling to stay afloat in an ever-changing world. The weathered door hung slightly ajar, and like an exclamation point to the nostalgia of the building, there was an old payphone with graffiti on its side to the right of the building. Deacon remembered this place from his time here before, but it had been much nicer then, and he wondered if Eric didn't realize it had fallen into disrepair, or if he had picked it for some other reason. Hoping that the interior had fared better than the exterior, Deacon killed the engine and headed for the front door. The inside of the coffee shop was nothing like the outside. It was cozy and inviting with warm yellow lights creating an intimate atmosphere. A hint of freshly roasted coffee beans mixed with the sweet scent of freshly baked goods tickling his nose, and the hum of low conversation along with the clinking of silverware floated through the air. The place wasn't busy, but the few worn couches were taken, as were some of the smaller wooden tables. That was fine with Deacon. A booth at the back would be better anyway. You looking to sit down or grab something to go? Deacon looked at the woman who'd spoken. Her name tag read Kimberly, and she had a kind smile that seemed genuine. Sit, please. I'll have a friend joining me shortly. Kimberly nodded, her blonde ponytail bobbing with the movement. You bet. Is a booth okay? Yeah, that one at the back would be perfect. Oh, okay, she said, clearly adjusting where she had planned to seat him. But she didn't ask questions, which he was grateful for. He took the far seat with his back to the wall. Not only did he want to be able to watch the entrance, but he'd learned long ago not to have his back to the action. Kimberly left him a menu and then moved off to wait on another table. Deacon glanced at the menu, but he was much more interested in the people in the coffee shop. People watching, or discerning, as he liked to call it, was another habit he still had from his days as a cop. It was always important to be aware of the people around, and while none of these people looked dangerous, he'd seen tragedies unfold in mere seconds before. And whatever steps he could take to mitigate those instances was worth it in his book. Eric walked in a few minutes later, wearing a dark jacket and jeans. He was grayer than Deacon remembered, and his face was a little more rugged and weathered. But when he held out his hand and smiled, Deacon could see the youthful energy sparkling in his eyes. Good to see you, Eric, he said, returning the man's handshake with a firm grip of his own. Eric had a strong build, but Deacon's body was like a temple finely chiseled and fueled to perfection. You too. Man, the years have been good to you. Deacon grinned. It's all that firefighter training and laying off the donuts. Shoot, I haven't had a donut in over a year, Eric said, laughing as he slid into the booth. Seriously, though, you look good. Much better than the last time I saw you. Deacon knew Eric was talking about the time he'd come into work drunk. It was one of the few times he'd been drunk in his life, but drinking was the only thing that numbed the guilt at the time, and so it had been a crutch. I am good. Life has been good. Sobered up, of course. Went back to church, moved to Fire Beach, and I've been working as a firefighter ever since. We lost a fine cop when you left, but I have no doubt that you're just as important on your engine. Thank you. It may not have been my original calling, but I feel like it's where I'm meant to be now. Kimberly appeared at their table then, halting the conversation for a moment. After taking their coffee orders, she disappeared again, and Deacon picked up where they had left off. 
thank you for agreeing to meet with me. Eric shrugged. I was happy to get your text, but I get the feeling this is about more than you just passing through and wanting to say hi. Deacon sighed. It is. Do you remember Shonda Turner? Eric's eyebrows lifted. The fiancé who sent you into that whirlwind? I had hoped she was out of the picture. She is, or was. Two days ago, she called me asking for help. I hadn't spoken to her since we broke up, but she said I was the only one she trusted. Again, the conversation halted as Kimberly set down their coffee before scurrying gracefully away. She was obviously a perceptive waitress and could tell they weren't up for small talk at the moment. Trusted for what? Eric asked. Deacon stared at the steam rising from his cup of coffee, his insides twisting slightly as Eric watched him carefully. He trusted Eric, but suddenly he wasn't sure he should have done this. What if Eric had been bought? What if he was part of the cover-up? Deacon closed his eyes for a minute and asked for guidance. When he felt abundant peace, he knew his questions were unnecessary. God had given him Eric's face, which meant he could trust his old friend. Taking a deep breath, he began. Shonda told me she witnessed a fentanyl buy a few weeks ago. She reported it to the police, but she said they told her it didn't happen. She wouldn't let it go, and eventually they convinced her job she was crazy and needed to see a therapist. At first, she didn't mind because she figured the more people who heard her story, the better. But she said strange things started happening after her visits. Strange things like what? Eric asked, before taking a sip of his coffee. Things being moved, light switches being on that she swore she turned off, that sort of thing. Then she said she started to have moments she couldn't remember, blank periods in her memory. She went to her job to ask for another therapist, but they told her he was the only one she could see. Eric's eyes widened at that. That seems odd. Where does she work? The hospital. Yeah, I thought it was odd too, so I went with her to the therapist appointment today. Not only did the doctor creep me out, but Shonda was messed up after the appointment dazed and lifeless for a good half hour afterwards. I don't know if it's drugs or hypnosis, but something happened in that office. Eric nodded, his eyes not leaving Deacon's face. I'm assuming that she's been told she'll lose her job if she doesn't attend these therapy sessions. Bingo, Deacon said. Shonda says that the person she saw in the exchange must be someone important, a kid related to someone high up in the force. Is it possible they're covering this up? Eric took a deep breath and glanced around the room before answering. Yeah, it's possible. Look, it's a good city, but there's been rumors that some stuff is getting swept under the rug. And this fentanyl thing? Someone's making money off it, so it wouldn't surprise me in the least. And Shonda? Is she in danger? Deacon could feel a band squeezing his heart at the mere thought. I don't know, Eric said with a sigh. My guess is yes, especially if she stops seeing the therapist. He's probably on the payroll and either trying to figure out what she knows or plant false memories in her head to make this all go away. The good news is that I'm hearing talk about this at the station, which means someone is looking into it. I'll do whatever I can to make sure that justice is served, but do you think you could get Shonda out of the city until this is dealt with? Deacon took a sip of his coffee, the warmth of the liquid a comfort to him. He felt a wave of relief wash over him, knowing that he had finally found someone he could trust. He just wished he had a better answer to his friend's question. I don't know. She loves her job, and she has a son who settled in school. I'm not sure she'd be willing to uproot her life for who knows how long. That's understandable, and she may not have to, but we need to figure out a plan in case we need to act quickly, Eric said. There's no telling how long these people have been getting away with this, or how quickly they'll strike if they realize she's standing up to them. Time is of the essence. Deacon nodded, understanding the urgency of the situation. He knew he had to find a way to protect Shonda and her son, but what could he do? He let out a frustrated sigh 
feeling overwhelmed. Tell me what else to do. I'm not a cop anymore, but I feel helpless just sitting and waiting. Eric rubbed a hand across his chin. We'll figure something out. I need to take this to some people I trust who are higher up the food chain. They'll help, but we need to make sure we don't move too soon and cause more trouble for her than she's already in. As hard as it is, you need to keep doing what you're doing. Stay close and protect her if push comes to shove. It wasn't the answer he wanted to hear, but it made sense. Okay, I'm in, but can you keep me in the loop if you hear anything? Of course. As Eric finished the last of his coffee, a movement to the side caught Deacon's eye. A man stood and hurried out of the coffee shop, and Deacon was hit with a feeling of deja vu. He'd seen that man before. Twice before. What are you doing? Eric asked as Deacon slid out of the seat. Come on, I might need your help. Deacon threw a 20 on the table and hurried toward the door. It was more than enough to cover their drinks. Kimberly would get a nice tip tonight. Wait, where are we going? Eric called as he hurried to catch up, but Deacon didn't answer. He pushed through the front door, ignoring the chill in the air that nipped at him and scanned the area. The man couldn't have gotten far. After all, he was an older gentleman, but it was like he had disappeared into thin air. Deacon heaved a sigh and clenched his fists in frustration. He didn't know who the man was, but he'd now appeared three times, which was too many to be a coincidence. He had to be following Deacon, but who was he? You want to tell me what that was about? Eric asked, glancing around the dimly lit parking lot. I don't know for sure. Last night I ate at Mama's. You know the old diner? Eric nodded and Deacon continued. An old man was there just watching me. He never said anything, but it was kind of creepy nonetheless. I wondered if he'd followed me from Shonda's, but I couldn't remember if he'd been there when I got there or not. Then earlier today at her appointment, there was a man in the lobby wearing a hoodie. He felt familiar, but I couldn't place him. But now, I'm almost positive it was the same man. The very same one who was in the coffee shop just now and ran out. But I have no idea where he could have gone so quickly. Eric stepped closer as he scanned the lot again. Do you think he's dangerous? Deacon shrugged. I don't know. I didn't get that feeling, but maybe... Why else would he be showing up everywhere I am? Eric nodded. Well, not much we can do tonight. Next time you see him, try to get a picture and send it to me. I'll run it through facial recognition and see if I can get a hit. Yeah, thanks. The offer made Deacon feel a little better, but only a little. Who was the man, and why was he following Deacon around? Listen, I've got to get home before my wife puts out an APB on me, but let's meet up again soon, okay? You're married? Deacon didn't know why that surprised him, except that he and Eric were nearly the same age, and he didn't even have someone significant in his life. Eric grinned. Yeah, going on six years now. It's great, but I have to remember I'm not making decisions just for me any longer, so I have to get going. Deacon said goodbye to Eric and climbed back in his truck. But as he made his way back to the hotel, he wondered if he would ever find what Eric had. Would he ever find someone he could spend the rest of his life with? Chapter 8. Shonda Shonda paced the kitchen floor, her low heels clacking against the linoleum. She knew she needed to tell Dante about Deacon but how did she do that without scaring him too much? He was only eight, too young to deal with something like this. He spilled into the kitchen like the whirlwind he was on school days and fell into the chair where she had a plate of pancakes waiting for him. Sorry I'm late, Mom. I couldn't find matching socks. She had no doubt about that. His room always looked like a tornado went through it, with clothes and toys strewn about. And it didn't matter how many times she asked him to clean it, a few days later it was a wreck again. What she didn't understand was his need to have matching socks. Most kids his age just grabbed whatever was closest. 
she'd seen some when she dropped him off who sported an ankle sock on one foot and a sock that stretched to the knee on the other foot. But Dante would have none of that. His room might be a mess, but he wanted to look put together whenever he went out. It made no sense in Shonda's head, but that didn't matter. That's okay, we've got a little time, she said, taking the chair across from him. She stared at him as she sipped her coffee. His skin was slightly darker than hers, a trait he'd gotten from his father, but his eyes were a light brown like hers, and she was fairly certain his smile mirrored her own. The cleft in his chin came from his father, too, and she had no doubt he would grow up to be as handsome as his father one day. Today, though, he was still her little boy, too little for the conversation she was about to have with him. Dante, do you know how we've talked about stranger danger? He looked up at her. Yeah, Mom, I know not to talk to strangers. I know you do, honey, but I need you to do something for me. I need you to let me know if you see someone hanging around school, even if they don't try to talk to you. Can you do that for me? Dante shrugged. I guess, but why? Am I in danger? Shonda shook her head. She definitely didn't want to plant that thought in his head, though it pounded a rhythm in hers. No, I don't think so, but I witnessed a crime a few weeks ago. Nothing has happened, but it's a good idea to just keep an eye out. Understand? Yeah, Mom, I got it. I'll let you know if I see anything. Good. One more thing. I have an old friend in town who's helping me out. You may see him at the house from time to time. There was definitely more she needed to tell him about Deacon, but not right now. One bombshell at a time was enough. Okay. Dante seemed to be taking this all in stride, but Shonda wasn't sure if that made her feel better or worse. She didn't want this life for him. Okay, hurry and finish. We need to get going. A few minutes later, she was loading everything into the car for work and heading for Dante's school. As she had done every day since witnessing the exchange, she scanned the area for anything amiss as she drove up to the parent drop-off. Her worst fear was that he was going to get out of her car, be halfway to the school, and then someone was going to swoop in and run off with him. That would be hard to do, as the distance between drop-off and the main entrance was only about 30 feet. Hard, but not impossible. Remember what I said, honey, about keeping your eyes open. I will, Mom. You know there are teachers here who get paid to do that, though, right? She was well aware, but she also knew they had to watch so many kids at once that something could happen to one while they were focused on another. She prayed it wouldn't happen, but the possibility gnawed at her all the same. She waved as he got out of the car, and then she waited for him to get all the way inside. Horns sounded behind her, but she didn't care. Inside, he was safe. At least, that's what she told herself. Only when the door closed behind him did she pull forward and head to work. There were no police cars as she pulled into the parking lot this morning, but there was something in the air. Maybe it was just her irrational fear or the anger that the therapist had clearly done something to her, though she didn't know what or for what purpose. But as she headed toward the big glass doors, a chill ran down her spine. Instinctively, she glanced around, but no one was there. She made her way to the elevator and to the pediatric floor, but the feeling only got worse. As soon as she clocked in and found her boss waiting for her, she knew why. HR called and they want to see you, Aaron said. Aaron's normally friendly face was pinched and tight. Did they say why? Shonda asked, afraid to hear the answer. Something about your therapy session. I thought you were going to them. I am. I have been. Aaron's brow lifted. Well, Amy is fired up about something. Hurry back, though. I need you today. Shonda nodded. 
She could guess what Amy was fired up about, although she hadn't expected to hear anything so quickly. Dr. Norris must have contacted Amy after the appointment, and she had no doubt he wanted to make it clear that Deacon wasn't welcome at any more appointments. What he didn't know was that she didn't plan on attending any more appointments, with or without Deacon, and if she lost her job, she and Dante would move somewhere else and start over. The HR department was down in the basement of the hospital and always gave Shonda the creeps. For some reason, the lights down here flickered more than on any of the upper floors, and because there were no windows, it seemed much darker, even during the brightest time of day. Plus, this level also housed the morgue, and though Shonda didn't fear dead bodies coming to life or anything, she wasn't sure she could work on the same floor as them. The HR office was empty, except for Amy, and Shonda wondered briefly where the others were. Maybe a meeting? Or maybe Amy had demanded they leave, since she didn't have a private office to meet in. Was Amy in on the cover-up, too? Ah, Shonda, so glad to see you got my message, Amy said, standing as Shonda entered. Amy had a stern expression, and her jaw was set firmly with her lips pulled into a tight line. Her eyes were narrowed and her brows were slightly furrowed, making her look much more intimidating than her medium height demanded. Her arms were crossed tightly across her chest, further emphasizing the hardness of her stance. Yes, Aaron gave it to me as soon as I arrived. What can I do for you? Shonda tried to keep her voice even. She was not going to let this woman walk all over her. Not anymore. Sit. Amy pointed to the chair across from her, and Shonda sat, though every fiber in her body told her to run. Amy wouldn't do anything to her here, would she? Shonda doubted there were cameras down here, but Aaron knew where she was. Amy would be stupid to harm her now. I received a very interesting call from Dr. Norris last night. Yeah, I bet you did, Shonda thought, but she merely tilted her head and waited for Amy to continue. He said your husband showed up with you at your appointment, but I told him he had to be mistaken as you don't have a husband, at least not according to your HR file. Amy tapped a blood-red nail against a manila folder, that Shonda realized now had her personal records in it. Was it illegal to lie about her personal life? Yes, as I told Dr. Norris, I didn't list him because we've been separated for years, but recently we've been working on reconciling. It frightened her how easy the lie rolled off her lips, but she realized some of that was due to the man being Deacon who had consumed her life, and her thoughts for the better part of a decade. Amy steepled her fingers together and pursed her lips, sending a deep crevice across her forehead. Someone should really tell her that making such severe expressions invited early wrinkles. I see. It is company policy that you declare when your marital status has changed, for insurance purposes, of course. Shonda doubted any of this had to do with insurance, but she nodded. Yes, of course, I'm so sorry. It happened kind of suddenly and I didn't realize. I will need his information in the next week, Amy said, and Dr. Norris has asked that he not attend any more of your therapy sessions. He felt you were distracted by this man's presence. I understand. Just Out of curiosity's sake, how much longer do I need to attend these therapy sessions? Amy's brow lifted, and Shonda realized that with her dark hair and pale skin, she looked more like she belonged in a vampire movie than an HR department. Until Dr. Norris says you are done, that is the agreement, unless you would like to find a job elsewhere. Shonda pasted on a smile. No, that's fine. I was just wondering, as it does take away from my work here at the hospital, 
and I know now that I must have been hallucinating the day I thought I saw a crime. He's helped me realize that. That's wonderful, but he doesn't think you're finished yet. You forgot to set your next appointment, so I did that for you. It's tomorrow at two. Tomorrow? But I've already seen him twice this week. She couldn't go tomorrow. She needed more time. Yes, well, I'm afraid he didn't find yesterday's session beneficial, so he asked for another this week. You will be there, yes? Of course. There was no way Shonda was stepping in that office again, but suddenly she wondered what she was going to do. Thinking about quitting and moving when she had five days left was much easier than realizing she might be fired tomorrow. As she headed back to the pediatric floor, she texted Deacon. She needed to tell him everything. Tonight. Hopefully, he would continue to help her, but if not, she needed to know so that she could figure something else out, though she had no idea what. Chapter 9 Shonda Shonda paced the floor of her living room, the walls that had once given her peace now closing in on her. She wanted to find solace in the familiar, but no matter how many circuits she made around the room, she felt further away from the comfort she craved. She wished she could erase the tension that had built up in recent days and find the peace she was so used to, but it didn't seem to be coming. Pulling out her phone, she stared at the screen and chewed on her lip. She knew she needed to talk to Deacon, but she also knew that she'd have to tell him everything, and she wasn't sure how that was going to go. She took a deep breath and tapped out the message. Please come over as soon as you can. I have something I need to tell you. Then she hit send before she could change her mind. With no idea how long it might take him, she wandered into the kitchen to make tea or a snack, anything to get her mind off the conversation she didn't want to have. As she turned the burner on, she glanced around at the kitchen. It was small, but homey. Not fancy, by any means, with its dark green countertops and checkered green and white linoleum floor. But it was clean and mostly organized, although it was very clear a child lived here as well. His drawings, though he didn't do them much anymore, covered the white refrigerator, and the cereal box he'd used this morning sat on the floor in front of the pantry, instead of on the shelf where it belonged. With a sigh, she picked it up and put it back in its proper place. What would happen if she lost her job? Would she and Dante have to move? She had some money in savings, but not enough to cover the house payment for long. The tea kettle whistled, and she turned the burner off quickly, not liking the way the shrill sound set her nerves on end. Maybe a move wouldn't be so bad. Maybe getting out of this house and this town was just what she needed. But she liked her job, and she would hate to uproot Dante. Hopefully Deacon would have some answers, or at least some advice. Warm tea in hand, she walked back into the living room and glanced out the window. Deacon's truck was just pulling into her drive. She took a small sip, set her mug down, and then squared her shoulders. The time had come. She opened the door before he even knocked and stepped back to let him enter. Out of habit, her eyes scanned the street behind him for anything out of the ordinary before focusing on him. Did something happen? He asked, closing the door behind him. You could say that. She led the way to the couch and motioned for him to sit down. I got called into HR today. Evidently, Dr. Nelson didn't like that you came to the appointment yesterday, and he wants another one this week, tomorrow. Deacon was already shaking his head before she finished. You can't go back, Shonda. I don't know exactly what that man did to you, but it's not good. She held up a hand to stop him. I know that I can't go back, but Deacon, if I don't, I will probably get fired tomorrow. We need to figure out a plan of what to do next. I have some savings, but they won't pay the bills for long. D 
Deacon sighed as he shifted on the couch. Okay, are there any other nursing jobs in the city you could get? Maybe, but that's the only hospital, so it would have to be at a doctor's office, and I don't know that anyone is hiring. Besides that, what if they blacklist me? I mean, whoever is behind this has some pull. What if they flag my name so that no one will hire me? She could tell from Deacon's minimal reaction that he had considered this as well. It's a possibility, for sure, but let's not create obstacles that don't exist yet. First, let's see if any other places are hiring. If you couldn't find a job as a nurse, could you do something else? Shonda sighed and folded her arms across her chest. Could she find another job? Maybe. But did she want to? Not really. For a short time, maybe. But hours are going to be an issue. What I like about the hospital is that they were willing to give me a shorter shift so that I could drop Dante off at school and be here when he comes home. I may not have that option with a new job, which will mean hiring someone to do that. He's too young to be home alone. Right. Deacon tapped his lips as he thought. Well, I can probably help out for a few days, though I don't know how much longer I can stay. I have a job back in Fire Beach that needs me too. Her eyes fell to her lap. Of course, he had a life he wanted to get back to. She wondered briefly if he had some one he needed to get back to as well. I know, I'm so sorry I dragged you into this. Deacon placed a hand on her arm. Hey, I'm not. I'm glad you called me. Eric is looking into this, but it may take some time. There is one other option we could consider. She lifted her eyes to his, hope filling her for the first time. What's that? You and Dante could come back to Fire Beach with me. If your name is flagged, I know someone who could help you get a new identity. You could even stay with me until you got settled. I know it's not ideal since you've created a life here, but it's an option. Shonda was quiet for a moment as she processed his words. If he was offering to let her live with him, even for a short time, then maybe there wasn't someone else in the picture. But would he see a future with her? especially after she told him the truth? And if he didn't, could she stay in his town? It's a good option. I have my job and Dante has his school, but that's all we have here. My parents passed a few years ago and there's nothing else tying us to the area. Do you think the hospital there would be hiring? I can make some calls, Deacon said. I've gotten to know several of the doctors, and while none of them are in charge of hiring... They could definitely put in a good word for anyone I vouch for. And if worse comes to worse, I know a guy who owns a restaurant who could hire you until something opens up. Shonda nodded slowly as she played out the scenario in her head. Okay, that's at least something. But she couldn't seriously entertain the idea until Deacon knew the whole story. She chewed on her lip and her eyes dropped to her lap where she dusted a minuscule piece of lint off her leg. There's something else I need to tell you before we consider that option, though. Something that might change your offer. Deacon furrowed his brow. Change my offer? What could you possibly have to tell me that would change my offer? We may not be together any longer, Shonda, but I want you to be safe, you and Dante. That's just it, she said. It's about Dante. Before she could say anything else, the front door flew open and Dante raced inside. Mom, there was a car today at school. You told me to watch for anything out of the ordinary, and I've never seen this car before. It was all black and was parked by the fence the whole day. The windows were dark, so I couldn't see if anyone was inside, but that's weird, right? It was more than weird, it was terrifying, but she couldn't let Dante know that. That's definitely weird, Dante. Her voice trembled with fear, no matter how hard she tried to keep it even. You never saw anyone, though? No one tried to talk to you? Dante shook his head. No, I stayed close to Mr. E, 
the recess teacher. Is it the bad guy's mom? She pulled him into a hug and kissed the top of his head, surprised that he didn't pull away like normal. No, sweetie, I'm sure it's nothing, but I need you to be extra careful from now on, okay? Keep your eyes open like you did today and tell me any time you see something out of the ordinary. Dante nodded and pulled back. Okay, Mom, I will. Can I go play video games now? A part of her wanted to say no because she didn't want to let him out of her sight for a minute, but she still needed to talk to Deacon, so she agreed. Sure, honey, I'll call you when dinner's ready. Cool. Without even acknowledging Deacon, he hurried out of the room. Deacon stared after him for a minute and then turned questioning eyes on Shonda. Shonda, how old is Dante? Chapter 10 Deacon Deacon waited for Shonda to answer, and when she didn't, he asked again. Shonda, how old is he? She swallowed audibly, and her eyes wouldn't quite meet his. He's eight. Eight. Deacon did the math in his head, and then he sank back into the couch. He was glad he was already sitting, or he might have collapsed on the floor. His gut felt like it was reeling from a well-placed sucker punch. Is he mine? He couldn't be. It wasn't possible but the math didn't lie. Shonda nodded, tears glistening in her eyes. But how is that possible? I took you in for the procedure. Though he had tried to forget it many times, Deacon remembered the day vividly. He remembered the silent ride to the clinic, the crisp fog that filled the air that morning. He could still hear the voices of the people praying outside, asking them not to kill their child. He could still smell the coppery scent of blood and disinfectant in the clinic, and he could still feel the desperation that pervaded the room. He had asked for forgiveness, but he had never forgotten. I know, but evidently the doctor botched something. You weren't in the room, but I've never experienced something like that. It was like I was a piece of meat on an assembly line and not a human patient. The doctor barely even said a word to me, just did the procedure, announced he was done, and left the room. I didn't know the procedure failed until I started feeling him kick. I was gaining weight, but I'd ignored it, telling myself it was depression from losing him and you. Deacon couldn't believe the words coming out of her mouth. Conflicting emotions barraged him, making him feel like he was in the middle of some sick game of tug-of-war. Why didn't you tell me? Shonda's eyes shifted to the floor and she chewed on her bottom lip. I should have, I know, but it was after we stopped talking. I told myself that you'd be mad if you knew since the procedure had been your idea. Plus, I heard that you'd fallen into drinking and I didn't want that in his life. I'm so sorry, Deacon. Deacon felt like the floor was falling out from beneath him. He had a son? A son that he thought he'd killed years ago. You should have told me, Shonda. I felt so guilty for so long. I know, and I'm so sorry. I should have followed your journey and told you once you got clean, but I didn't know you would, you know? Deacon understood where she was coming from, but it didn't make it any easier to process. For eight years, he'd carried this burden around, a burden that wasn't even true, and he'd missed everything, things he could never get back. Dante's birth, his first words, his first steps. Did Dante even know about him? From the kid's apparent lack of interest in him just moments ago, he doubted it. So what had Shonda told Dante? That his father hadn't wanted him? that he was dead? I, I need some air. I understand. Will you be back, though? The resigned tone in Shonda's voice tugged at his heart, but he couldn't think about her feelings, not yet, at least. He had to sort his own feelings out. 
Yeah, I just need to process. Before she could say anything else, Deacon pushed himself off the couch and headed for the front door. His legs felt like rubber, and he was surprised they were moving at all. The cool outside air hit him like a slap, but he didn't mind. It was good to feel something, because the rest of him was numb. He closed the front door behind him and leaned against it for a moment. What did this mean? Could he now be a part of Dante's life? If she didn't lose her job, would he want to move here to be closer to him? Would she still consider moving to Fire Beach? His brain ached from the questions playing on an incessant repeat. Without really knowing where he was going, he forced his feet to move. Down the steps, down the path to the sidewalk out front. Then he turned left, unsure of a destination but feeling the need to move. Why, God, he whispered softly. Why would you let me think I killed my son for eight years? But he knew at least part of that answer. He had not been living a life for God before this. This event had changed him and helped him return to his roots, to God. But eight years? Why did he have to suffer for eight years? Suddenly, Job flashed into his mind. Job suffered much more than Deacon could ever imagine. But God used that suffering to bring people to him. Perhaps he had done the same with Deacon's suffering. Maybe he wouldn't have been such a light if he hadn't been so broken, if he hadn't walked so long in the darkness. Too often, people focused only on their story and forgot that God was dealing with a much bigger story up above. Still, it was hard. All the firsts that a father should get to see, he'd missed, and it hurt. It ached in his chest with a fierceness he'd never known before. A chill raced down his spine, and he glanced around. He'd been so focused on the situation that he'd forgotten to pay attention to the surroundings. And now he could feel that something was off. It wasn't quite night, but the sun was low in the sky and the street lights were popping on, sending their faint hum into the air. Everything seemed still but then he saw it. A black car with dark windows. At first glance, the car appeared parked, but on a closer look, it was several feet from the curb as if they'd pulled over as soon as he slowed. His heart began to pound in his chest. Was this the same car Dante had seen? It had to be, but why were they following them now? Careful to keep his emotions as normal as possible, He continued his walk and listened for the sound of the engine. Sure enough, it was there, though quiet. Probably an electric vehicle then. But what did they want? Should he keep going or turn back? Would turning back draw more attention to himself? He decided to play it off like he was just taking a quick walk around the block to clear his head. After all, his truck was back at the house anyway, so he had to go back there eventually, and going this way would at least give him the appearance of not having noticed the car. He turned at the next block, but kept his ears tuned. When he reached the end of the block, he glanced back as surreptitiously as he could. The black car was just making the turn. He made another left and then another until he was back at Shonda's house. His head still wasn't entirely clear, and a part of him wanted to jump in his truck and leave, But he knew he couldn't leave Shonda and Dante alone, and he realized this was why he'd packed the small bag. When he'd first gotten Shonda's text, he'd nearly jumped in the truck and raced over. But something had held him back. Some feeling that he might need to be prepared? So he'd taken the time to throw a small bag together with his clothes and toiletries and brought it with him. He grabbed it from his truck now before approaching the front door again. The door was locked when he tried the handle. Good for her. So he knocked and waited. It opened a few seconds later, and she stared out at him with questioning eyes. Can I come in? He asked. She nodded and stepped back. I thought you'd left. I went for a walk. He shut the door behind him and then peeked out the window. I was going to go back to my hotel room, but a black car decided to follow me. Have you noticed it before? 
Shonda shook her head, her eyes wide with fear. No, do you think it's the same car Dante saw? I can't say for sure, but my gut says yes. Shonda sank into the couch. Are we too late then? Should we call the police? Deacon didn't know the answer to that question. He dropped his bag to the floor and sat beside her. I don't know. They haven't done anything besides observe yet, so we might be okay, but I think you and Dante should pack a bag just in case. She nodded slowly. How did you know to pack one? I don't know. God, I guess. It was a feeling I got at the hotel when I got your text, so I brought it with me tonight. I guess I'm glad I did, because I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving you two alone. Are you okay if I stay? Shonda grabbed his hands, and Deacon tried to ignore the feelings that surged through him. Yes, please stay. I don't want to be alone here. I know you can't do much, but I feel safer having you here. Deacon nodded. He felt better being here as well. Plus, it would give him more time to get to know Dante. He glanced toward the hall that Dante had disappeared down. Does he know about me? Shonda shook her head and let go of his hands. No, but I'll tell him, I promise. Just give me time. What did you tell him about his father? The truth, mostly. I told him his father didn't know I was pregnant and doesn't know about him. He asked me why I didn't make contact with you, and I told him that I didn't know where you were or how to contact you. I know it's cowardly, but I'm not ready to tell him who you are yet. Can I just say that you're an old friend staying for a bit? Her words cut like glass through his heart, but Deacon nodded. You can for now, but he needs to know. He deserves to know. I know, and I will tell him, I promise. Fine, I need to make a phone call, and I'll be right back. She opened her mouth to object, but he held up a hand. I'm going to call Eric and see if any of the cameras can see the car. Maybe we can get a plate and figure out who this is. Shonda nodded. You're right. I'll put on some coffee. I have a feeling we have a lot to talk about. Deacon chuffed. That was the understatement of the century. Pulling his phone from his pocket, he dialed Eric as he moved to another part of the house, away from Shonda's hearing. Deacon, what's up? I'm at Shonda's house and a black car just followed me around the block. I think it might have also been at Dante's school earlier. Do you think you could tap into the cameras and see if you see it? I didn't get a license number and I don't want to go back outside and draw suspicion. Yeah, give me the street names. I'm not sure of the school. I'll text you that when I find out. But her house is Vine and 36th. Vine and 36th, Eric repeated, and Deacon could hear the clicking of computer keys through the phone. Man, there's no cameras near there. Send me the school name and I'll see what I can find out. And stay alert. I'm looking into it, but I have no idea who we're dealing with yet. Yeah, I will. Thanks. Deacon ended the call, but he wondered if he'd be able to deliver on that promise. Right now, they were sitting ducks, and he didn't know how to change that. Chapter 11. Shonda Shonda had the coffee ready when Deacon re-entered the kitchen. Worry lines creased his face, sending the fear tumbling through her body. If Deacon was worried, it had to be bad. Find anything helpful? she asked, placing a steaming mug in front of him. She placed two sugar packets down and then realized she didn't know if that's still how he drank his coffee. In fact, she couldn't believe she remembered how he drank it after all these years. Deacon shook his head as he tore one of the packets and dumped it in the coffee. Eric says there's no cameras around here to get a view of the car. Oh, he did ask for the name of Dante's school, though, since there should be some around it. Shonda nodded. It's Roosevelt, but I don't know if he should go back. She sank into the chair across from Deacon. I hate the thought of sending him to school where I can't protect him. They didn't approach him today, but what if they try tomorrow? Eric thinks we should get out of town for a while, and I think I agree. 
Do you have any sick leave at your work? Did she have sick leave? She never took a day off. So yeah, she was pretty sure there were days, if not weeks. Unless they decide to take that from me as well, then yeah. Deacon said nothing about her sarcasm, but she figured he understood. Good. Call in sick tomorrow and then we'll leave town. You can contact someone in the next few days to put in your notice. You said you'll probably get fired tomorrow for not attending the therapy sessions, so let's just go now. Come back to Fire Beach with me and start over. I know you don't know the people there, but I have a large group of friends who would all watch out for us, for Dante. Shonda stared across the table at Deacon. The strong man before her was so much like the man she'd loved, the one she'd thought was gone. But he was also different. He was driven, but not obsessed, chiseled, but not harsh. It would be so easy to go with him, to fall for him again, but was it the right decision? Let me pray about it tonight. She didn't always have time for church with her schedule, but she'd made a conscious effort to have time for God from the day Dante was born. She'd been so struck that day by the horror of what she'd tried to do that she'd given her life to God as she'd laid in the hospital bed and stared at her son. I will too, Deacon said, but I'd like for you guys to pack a bag in case we have to make a quick exit. A quick exit. The words themselves were dull, harmless, but the connotation behind them chilled her to the core. The need for a quick exit would mean that someone was after them, or that something had happened, or was about to. Okay, I'll go pack us both a bag and then I'll start dinner. Do you think you can keep Dante entertained? Are you kidding? I'd love to hang out and get to know him. Deacon's eyes danced, and a pang of guilt shot through her. She'd deprived him of so much. Both of them, really. Neither Deacon nor Dante could get those years back, but maybe they could have a relationship going forward. She stopped at Dante's room on the way to her own. Dante, I need to start dinner. Why don't you take your game to the living room and show Mr. Deacon? Dante groaned. Aw, oh, Mom, do I have to? Yes, you have to. He's a guest in this house. And since I'll be making dinner for everyone, you can at least talk to him. Dante rolled his eyes, but turned off his game and headed toward the living room. She wondered if his reaction to spending time with Deacon would be different if he knew Deacon was his father. A tiny voice whispered that she should tell him, but she couldn't. Not yet. She just needed him out of his room so she could grab some clothes for him. There was no need to scare him yet and she would tell him when things calmed down a little. He was already dealing with too much change as it was. That's what she told herself. But inside, she had to admit that she was just being a coward. It had been her and Dante for years, and she was very afraid that when he learned about his father, that would change forever. No, she couldn't think about that. Wouldn't think about that. There were too many other things to worry about. After a final glance toward the living room to make sure he was occupied, she grabbed a few clothing items from his room before heading to hers and doing the same. She stuffed them into a bag along with an extra hairbrush, toothbrush, and other necessities, and then made her way to the kitchen to start dinner. The sun had barely sunk beneath the horizon, but Shonda couldn't shake the feeling of fear in her bones. Something was going to happen. She could feel it buzzing in the air like a static current. It lifted the fine hairs on the back of her neck and rolled around in her stomach like rocks. Still, she was determined to make dinner and get through the evening without incident. She moved around the kitchen, throwing ingredients together, her mind racing with possibilities. Would the people in the car try to get in the house? Would they lie in wait and grab them tomorrow? Maybe it was nothing. Maybe it was her imagination playing tricks on her. But she couldn't shake the feeling that something was lurking in the shadows, waiting, watching. 
The sound of something rustling outside the window made her freeze, her heart racing as she peered into the darkness, trying to make out a figure. But nothing was there. She let out a sigh of relief and began to chop the green peppers, her hands shaking slightly. She could hear Deacon and Dante in the living room, Dante telling him all about the game and the items he was trying to win. Though she was jealous of their time, it also gave her a modicum of peace. They were talking, like father and son, like nothing else was happening, like no one was after them. Shonda took a deep breath and tried to steady her nerves. She was still worried, but the conversation between Deacon and Dante was calming. She finished prepping the vegetables and put the chicken in the oven. She glanced out the window one last time and was surprised to see how dark it looked. Yes, it was getting later, but usually the streetlights lit up the area. Tonight, though, they didn't appear to be doing a very good job as shadows filled the backyard. Just then, the sound of a branch breaking caught her attention and she screamed. Within seconds, Deacon was in the kitchen asking her what was wrong. She pointed out the window. I heard something. It sounded like a branch breaking, and it's so dark outside. Why is it so dark outside? Deacon peered out the window and then hurried to the living room. When he returned, his voice was stern. The streetlights are out, and I don't think it's an accident. Grab your bags and some food. We're going now. It took only a moment for his words to register, and then Shonda grabbed a sack and began throwing packaged food in it. She didn't keep a lot in the house as she preferred to cook healthy dinners for Dante, but there were Pop-Tarts and granola bars for his lunch, as well as some protein bars for herself. All of them went into the sack. Mom, what's happening? Fear laced Dante's voice, making him sound younger than his eight years. Grab your game and your bear and throw them in the bag on my bed. Why? But before Shonda could respond, Deacon took over. He knelt down so he was at eye level with Dante and placed his hands on the boy's shoulders. Do you know how your mom saw a crime a few weeks ago? Dante nodded. Well, they don't like that your mom tried to get the police involved. We think they might try to get in this house, so we're going to go somewhere safe. Can you be brave with us? Okay, Dante said, though his eyes remained large and fearful. I'll even come with you, Deacon said, flashing her a tight smile before leading Dante back toward his room. Finished with the bag, Shonda grabbed a few bottles of water and threw them in too. When she reached the living room, Deacon was already there, her bag on his shoulder. Dante had his backpack on and a solid set to his shoulders, though she could still read the fear on his young face. Shonda, before we go, you need to turn off your cell phone. What? Why? Because I don't know if they're monitoring your cell phone, but I know they can't while it's off. You can bring it, but it has to stay off until all of this is cleared up. We'll get you a new one when we get to where we're going. Shonda nodded. That made sense, and she wasn't addicted to her phone anyway, like many of the younger employees she knew. But it felt weird to know she wouldn't have it for the foreseeable future. However, keeping Dante safe was more important. So she turned the phone off and shoved it in her pocket. Good. Grab my bag, turn out the lights, and then open the door, Deacon said. Won't they see us? Shonda asked her nerves coiling into a tight ball in her stomach. Maybe, but I'm hoping with the lights off in here and out there that we might be able to make it to the truck without drawing too much attention. The interior lights of the truck are going to clue them in one way or the other. I don't have a way to turn those off. Right, but before we go, let's pray. She grabbed Dante's hand and placed her other hand on Deacon's arm and then asked the Lord for safety. The words didn't feel like enough, but they were all she had. Then she opened the door, and like thieves in the night, they hurried to the truck. She expected the sound of gunfire or for someone to attack her from behind, but they made it to the truck without incident. Did that mean the men had left, or were they just waiting for a better opportunity? Chapter 12 
Deacon. Deacon checked quickly to make sure Shonda and Dante were both buckled in before he backed out of the driveway. He scanned the area for the black car, but with the lights out, it was difficult to see. How had they managed to do that anyway? Didn't city lights run on a schedule? Were they so well connected that they had control of parts of the city as well? If so, this might be bigger than he'd thought. And to say he was glad they were leaving town was an understatement. Where are we going? Dante asked. He was in the middle between Deacon and Shonda, protected on either side, but his voice was still small and scared. He glanced at Shonda, wondering if he should answer or if she would. When she caught his eye, he lifted his brow in question and she nodded. We're going to my city for a little bit. Think of it like a mini vacation. Does that mean I don't have to go to school? Deacon marveled at how fast the kid could shift gears. Two seconds ago, he was scared, and now he was excited? I thought you liked school, Shonda said. Dante shrugged. It's okay, I guess, but missing school would be even better. Well, you'll miss a few days, but if we stay longer than a week, we'll either have to get you in school or I'll have to teach you. I won't have you falling behind. As Deacon turned off Shonda's street, something in his rearview mirror caught his attention. He peered closer, and though it was still too dark to see here, he was certain the black car was behind them. Seeing his actions, Shonda turned and peered out the back window. Is it? She let the question hang in the air. Deacon nodded. Yeah, pretty sure. Look, grab my phone and dial Eric's number. Tell him we're headed out of town but being followed, and ask him to track my number. He glanced over at her, not wanting to say the words aloud that jostled and tumbled in his head. Just in case. Just in case what? Dante asked, looking from one adult to the other. It's nothing, honey. Don't worry about it, Shonda said as she grabbed Deacon's phone. A few seconds later, she was on the phone with Eric and relaying the situation. Deacon marveled at how she managed to sound vague so as not to worry Dante, but still managed to be specific enough to get the information to Eric. He wondered if it was a parental trait and if he would hone that skill if he got to spend more time with Dante. Ahead, Deacon could see lights. Evidently, this section of the grid hadn't been touched and a look in the mirror again confirmed the black car was following them. He had no idea if the car would follow them out of town, and he couldn't very well drive to Fire Beach with a tail, so he decided to see if he could shake them. Hold on, he said, as he took a sharp right at the next intersection. Though it was night and there were fewer cars on the road, Deacon didn't want to chance causing an accident. So while he sped up, he kept the speed manageable. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to shake the tail. He tried another sharp turn, alleyways and side streets, but it was no use. The black car was keeping pace. Shonda's face was a mask of fear, and Deacon could hear Eric's voice through the phone asking what was happening. Dante was silent, but his eyes were wide and his hands clutched his bag, like it was the strap holding him in a roller coaster. He drove faster, careening around corners, but the black car matched his speed. He had no choice but to keep going. Finally, they ended up on a dead-end road. The black car was behind them, though they'd managed to gain a little distance. Unfortunately, it didn't matter, as now there was no escape. Deacon slammed on the brakes and the car skidded to a stop. An old brick warehouse loomed ahead. It was not his first choice, but their options were to run or face whoever was after them, and the latter held no appeal. Come on, he said, grabbing his bag and helping Dante out of the truck. Shonda followed suit, clutching her bag on one shoulder and his phone in her other hand. We're at a warehouse, Eric, Deacon shouted toward the phone. Send back up. He pulled on the door, surprised when it opened easily. 
The warehouse didn't appear to be in use any longer, so maybe the owner had decided a lock wasn't necessary. Or they were stepping into a trap. Deacon pushed the thought from his mind. No use even flirting with that road. The air inside the warehouse was stale and musty, and there was little light. Turn on the flashlight on the phone, and let's see if we can find something to block the door with. Shonda did as he asked and handed back his phone before pulling her own from her pocket and turning its light on as well. Shadows jumped and danced around the cavernous space, and Deacon could feel the fear from Dante and Shonda floating in the air. His own heart beat wildly in his chest, but he was determined not to let the fear win. In the corner, he found a long, slender pole and managed to stick it through the handles of the door. It wouldn't hold forever, but hopefully it would buy them enough time. Come on, he said, leading the way deeper into the bowels of the warehouse. He wasn't sure exactly what he was hoping to find. A back exit would be nice, but with his truck on the other side, that would leave them to run on foot, which wasn't the brightest idea. So maybe just a room where they could hide until Eric showed up. Hopefully, it wouldn't be long. The warehouse was devoid of equipment, but it was clear that people had been inside at some point, as his light caught more than a few spray-painted words as they walked. What was this place? Dante asked, his voice sounding much louder in the silence of the space. Before either of them could answer, a loud banging noise echoed through the cavernous space. Whoever was after them was at the door and banging on it with something. Deacon picked up his pace, making sure he wasn't going so fast that Dante and Shonda couldn't keep up, but knowing that they had to find a place to hide and soon. As if God was listening and answering his prayer, a door appeared ahead of him. He tugged on the handle, sure that it would be locked, but it swung open easily. Inside, he said, over the banging noise still filling the air. Shonda and Dante followed his command, and then he closed the door behind them. It had a lock, which he engaged, though he doubted it would do much good. Shining his light around the space, he realized this had once been an office. And while there wasn't much furniture still in the room, there was a lone desk. It wouldn't keep the people after them from getting in, but it might slow them down a little. Help me move the desk, he said to Shonda, setting his phone down with the light shining up so they could see. She grabbed the other side, and together they pushed the desk into place, blocking the door. How long do you think that will hold them? she asked. I don't know. I'm just hoping long enough that Eric can get here, he said. Mom, what's this? Deacon shined his light toward the sound of Dante's voice and found the kids staring at another door. It was much smaller than the entrance, definitely big enough for him, though it would be a tight squeeze for Deacon. Do we open it? Shonda asked, the tremble in her voice much more pronounced now. Maybe it's an exit. We should at least check. Deacon approached the door, wishing he felt as confident as his words sounded. He turned the handle and pushed the door in. It didn't lead outside, but he was not expecting what he saw on the other side. Chapter 13 Deacon The room was dark, but tiny lights and screens lit up the room. What in the world? Deacon stepped further into the room and approached one of the TV screens. It showed another part of the warehouse, or at least he thought it did. Without lights, it was still too dark to see much. He glanced to another screen and could just make out two figures standing at the front doors. There were at least three other places that had video cameras streaming to them, but without light, he couldn't make out what they were. What is this place? This time, it was Shonda who asked, but he had no clear answer for her either. It was obviously not the abandoned warehouse they thought it was, but what exactly it was remained unclear. I have no idea, but this might buy us a little more time. 
He checked the door they had entered and found a small deadbolt. It wouldn't last long, but hopefully Eric would be here by the time the men arrived and found it. He pulled out his phone and dialed his friend, but the call would not connect. Evidently, something in this room blocked communication, so he would just have to wait and pray that Eric showed up in time. Mommy, can I rest now? Dante's voice still held some fear, but added to that was a note of exhaustion. Deacon checked his watch and realized it was past dinner time and probably close to the boys' bedtime. Of course, honey. Shonda laid down her coat in one of the corners, then sat and patted her lap. Dante curled up on the floor, placing his head in her lap. There wasn't much else to the room besides the screens, but Deacon searched anyway, hoping he would find something they could use to either communicate with the outside world or stay safe from whoever was after them. When he realized there was nothing, he too chose a spot and sat down. He wasn't exhausted like Dante, but a few minutes of recharge would be good for him too. It was oddly silent in the warehouse, and he wondered if the men had left or if the room simply blocked outside noise. He awoke to the feel of a hand on his shoulder. Snapping his eyes open, he started and glanced around. Shonda and Dante were both asleep in the corner. He turned to look at who had touched him and found himself staring into the face of the man from the restaurant. Fear gripped his heart. Had he been one of the ones after them? But that made little sense. Why wake Deacon? He could have just killed them all in their sleep. Unless he planned to torture them first or use them as some sort of bait. The man placed a finger to his lips and shook his head, indicating he wished Deacon to remain silent. Then he motioned for Deacon to follow him. Who are you? Deacon asked. There was no way he was following a strange man until he knew the man was safe. The man turned back to him and simply held out his hand, as if hoping Deacon would shake it. Though he didn't know why, he found his hand reaching out to perform the action. And while the man said nothing, as soon as their palms touched, Deacon felt peace. He didn't know who this man was, but he knew he wasn't there to hurt them. Nodding at the man, he released the shake and then turned to wake up Shonda and Dante. What's going on? Shonda asked, her voice groggy with sleep. Did they find us? No, we're getting out of here. Did your friend find us? Deacon thought about that for a second. She was referencing Eric, and the man certainly wasn't Eric, but Deacon felt the man was a friend. Something like that. Come on. He shook Dante again until the boy rubbed his eyes and sat up. Are we safe? Not yet, but we will be. The two grabbed their bags and followed Deacon out of the small door. He didn't think that much time had passed, but there was a soft glow in the other room, enabling him to see the man who stood at the other entrance, motioning for them to follow. Deacon led the way, following the man back into the cavernous space, only he didn't lead them toward the front. Instead, he led them into another door that Deacon hadn't seen before. This door opened into a tunnel of some sort. The walls were close, but there was enough room to move. Then suddenly the walls were earthen, and the smell of dirt filled the air. Where are you taking us? Shonda asked. Out, I hope. Though Deacon felt he could trust the mysterious man they were following, tiny doubts shouted in his mind that the man was leading them into the bowels of the earth to do horrible things to them. He imagined the crunch of bones beneath his feet and the odor of iron in the air from dried blood, but none of that was real. The tunnel straightened out, and they walked that way for what seemed like an hour. Then, slowly, the tunnel began to shift upward. The walls once again became man-made material, and then light filled the area. Deacon shielded his eyes, blinking against the bright light that seemed so much brighter after walking in the dim light. When he could see again, he made his way up the small stairs and breathed in the fresh air. 
He glanced around for the man who had led them, but he was nowhere. What in the world? He didn't realize he had uttered the words aloud until Shonda responded. What? What's wrong? The man we were following, he's gone. He scanned the area. They appeared to be in an abandoned lot of some kind. There was a field of tall grass to the right that he supposed the man could have disappeared into. But why? Why run off if he was a friend? What man? Shonda asked, looking around. The man. You didn't see him in front of me? As she shook her head, he turned to look behind them. The warehouse was there, but they were on the other side of the dead end. Even more intriguing was that there was a car sitting right in front of them. Whose car is that? Shonda asked, stepping up beside him. I think it's ours. Deacon walked toward the car and peered inside. Sure enough, a set of keys dangled from the ignition. Come on. Deacon, we can't take that car. That would be stealing. Not if it was meant for us. Look around, Shonda. There's no one here. Who would leave a car with the keys in the ignition here? I don't know, but who would leave a car for us to take? Who even knew we were here? Eric did. Maybe he knew about the passage and left it here for us, hoping we would find a way out. Look, I'll call him as soon as we're out of the city. I want to get my truck back anyway. But for now, let's not look for problems that don't exist. Let's take this gift and get out of here. If we drive straight through, we can be back in Fire Beach by morning. She shook her head, but he could see the resignation taking root in her expression, especially when she looked down to see Dante half asleep against her leg. Fine, but we return this car to the owner as soon as possible. Agreed, Deacon said. He opened the back door of the car and was unsurprised to find a pillow and blanket waiting there. He helped get Dante situated and then pulled the blanket over him. A blanket and a pillow? Shonda asked when he shut the door. Do you really think Eric left us this? I have no idea who else would, Deacon said, as he opened the passenger door for her. As he closed it and made his way around to the driver's side, though, he couldn't help but wonder if the man had left this car for them. But why? And who was this mysterious man? Chapter 14 Deacon Exhaustion clung to Deacon like a wet blanket when he finally pulled into his driveway several hours later. Shonda and Dante had slept the entire ride, and in an effort not to wake them, he had driven the entire time with the radio down. It had been some nice quiet time with the Lord, and also a little too much time to think. Like, about who the mysterious man was, how he knew they were in the warehouse, what that warehouse actually was, and why the man saved them. He still needed to call Eric later, but it would have to wait until he'd had some sleep. There was no way he could carry on a coherent conversation at the moment. In fact, it was a wonder he hadn't fallen asleep at the wheel. Shonda. He shook her shoulder gently after turning off the car. Wake up. We're here. She rubbed her eyes and blinked at him. Where? My house in Fire Beach. That got her attention, and she sat up, grimacing and rubbing her neck as she did. We're already here? Yep. You and Dante slept the whole way. He glanced into the back seat, where the boy was still curled under the blanket, his bear in his arms. Oh, Deacon, I'm so sorry. I should have helped with the driving or something. Deacon placed a hand on her arm. Hey, You've had a lot going on the last few weeks. It's understandable. And you wouldn't have known the way to get here anyway. Let's get you guys inside and settled. And you can make it up to me by making that dinner we never got last night when I finally wake up. Deal? Her mouth pulled into a small smile. Deal. Deacon nodded and removed his hand, though he didn't want to. He liked touching Shonda. He missed it but he had no idea if she felt the same, 
which was going to make this very awkward until they had a necessary heart-to-heart. Why don't you wake Dante and I'll unlock the door? Yeah, of course. He hurried up the short walk to his place, but fumbled with the key. His vision was growing hazy, and he knew he wouldn't last much longer without decent sleep. As a fireman, he often worked long hours, but the adrenaline of the job kept him awake, and he took short naps when he could. He had neither of those things now. When the door opened, he flicked the light switch, scanning the room as he did. He didn't think he'd left the place a mess, but he was too tired to remember for sure. Thankfully, everything was in its place, so he continued to the guest room, stopping at the hall closet to grab an extra blanket and pillow. The guest room wasn't large, but there was a bed and a dresser. Hopefully, Shonda wouldn't mind sharing a bed with her son, at least until he could get them bigger accommodations. He tossed the blanket and pillow on the bed and then made his way back to the front door to meet Shonda and Dante. The boy was still mostly asleep and hung from Shonda's shoulder like a limp rag doll. Without thinking to ask, Deacon scooped the child up and carried him to the guest room, placing him on the bed. Thank you, Shonda said as she covered Dante with the blanket. You should get some sleep now. I can't believe you stayed awake the whole way. Neither could Deacon. I will. I'm going to lock the front door and then crash. Do you need anything else? A sad smile played at her lips. Besides going back in time? No, I'm good. I'm assuming you won't mind if I scavenge for some food if I wake before you? Deacon shook his head. My house is yours. Feel free to rummage around for whatever you need. Thank you again. Deacon nodded and stepped out of the room. After locking the front door and checking the back one, he stumbled toward his own room. His bed beckoned him like an oasis in a desert, and his eyes closed as his head hit the pillow. Deacon opened his eyes to light streaming in his windows. He blinked at his watch, shoving back the covers when he realized it was after two in the afternoon. How had he slept so long? He quickly changed into new clothes. He couldn't remember the last time he'd slept in his clothes, and headed to the kitchen. Shonda looked up from the table as he entered. Hey, feeling better? Yeah, I guess. Where's Dante? Shonda rolled her eyes. Sulking in the room. He realized he left behind his favorite game and doesn't understand why we can't go back to get it. Speaking of which, when do you think we'll be able to go back, at least to get our stuff? Deacon pulled out a chair and sat across from Shonda. I don't know. I'm going to call Eric in a minute and see what he says. Maybe he can even send someone in if it's going to be a while. He didn't want her to leave, but he understood that her life was there. But we should talk about Dante. She sighed. I know. He needs to know and you need to be able to spend time with him. I'm just not sure how to tell him. One word at a time? We don't have to tell him the whole sordid past. We can tell him we broke it off before I knew about him and that we lost touch. That's mostly the truth anyway. You make it sound easy. Deacon shook his head. Not easy, but simple. Look, let me get something to eat and call Eric. Then we can figure out the best way to tell him. Shonda inhaled deeply and nodded. It's just so much change. But you're right, he deserves to know. There's some leftover curry on the stovetop if you want that for lunch. Thanks, I will. He filled a bowl and then pulled out his cell phone and dialed Eric's number. Deacon, are you guys okay? Where are you? Eric asked, skipping the normal greeting. We're fine. We're out of town. He didn't know why he didn't tell Eric they were back at his house, but something stopped him. Caution, maybe? But he trusted Eric, didn't he? That's good, but how did you get out of town? Your truck is still here. We found a car with the keys in it. I'm happy to return it if it's safe to come get my truck. You stole a car? Well, not exactly. It was there waiting for us. 
I assumed you had left it for us, but I'm guessing from the surprise in your voice that you didn't. No, I didn't. How did you even get out of the warehouse? We had the place surrounded and never saw you. There's a room in there that leads to a tunnel. We followed it and ended up in an abandoned lot a block or so away. Eric, I think something fishy is going on in that warehouse. We found a room with video monitors. I know the place looks abandoned, but I think maybe it's used for human trafficking or something worse. On the other end, Eric sighed. Yeah, we found the room, and you're right. We tracked down all the cameras, and it looks like they were used to make films. I have no idea who's behind that, but I guess I'll be adding that case to my load. Speaking of which, we caught the two men who followed you, but I don't know if they're linked to the fentanyl issue yet. Because they're not talking. They have to be, though, right? Why else would they have been watching Shonda? I don't know, but I promise I'm looking into it. Regardless, I don't think it's safe to come back yet. We're still working on the department issue here, and it looks like it might be a while. You know how it is. Deacon understood. He hadn't known any bad cops while he was on the force, but he'd heard stories of a few. Men who had started out good, but became corrupted by money or the lack of justice they saw. Because of their training, and sometimes their positions, it was often hard to pin a crime to them, and even more challenging to get other cops to bring them in. It was something the department was working on, but it was an uphill climb. I hear you. Listen, uh, Shonda needs a few things from her house. We left in too much of a hurry to take much, and I'd like my truck back. If I send you a list, can you have someone pick up the items and then meet me to do an exchange? Yeah, that should be doable. Send me a list in a meeting place and we'll get it done. Thanks. I'll send it soon. As soon as he ended the call, Shonda looked up at him. What did he say? He caught the guys who chased us, but he hasn't been able to determine if they're related to the fentanyl issue. Her forehead wrinkled in confusion. What does that mean? It means there's no quick answer here. I know this isn't what you planned, but Eric doesn't think it's safe to go back yet. Shonda shook her head. I don't know that it will ever be safe to go back. Deacon laid a hand on her arm. Hey, no matter how long it takes, we'll figure it out. Don't worry. Those were easy words to say, but they rung hollow even to Deacon. How could he tell her not to worry when it gnawed at him like a dog that refused to give up its bone? Chapter 15 Shonda Shonda knew it had to be done. She had to tell Dante that Deacon was his father. Ever since he'd begun asking questions a few months back, she'd known it would have to be done. Now they were staying at Deacon's house for who knew how long, and it wasn't fair to either of them for her to keep the information from him. But no matter what way she spun it, she knew it would be difficult. How did you tell your son that the father he'd never known was sitting across the table from him? And how did she prepare herself for whatever reaction came her way? Mom, when can we go get my game? Dante asked, setting down his burger. We can't go back for a little while, but Mr. Deacon is going to meet up with someone who will grab it from the house. Dante glanced over at Deacon and smiled. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Shonda knew now was the time. She could see the emotion radiating from Deacon's gaze, though he was probably unaware of it. Dante was also oblivious for now, but it wouldn't be long before he'd start to ask why Deacon looked at him so strangely. Dante, there's something else about Mr. Deacon you should know. Deacon lifted a brow in question, but she nodded. She would never be fully prepared, but she couldn't put it off any longer. Is he going to take me to his firehouse? She should have been prepared for this question. He'd been asking it ever since he'd found out Deacon was a firefighter. No, I mean, maybe, but that's not what I need to tell you. They hadn't discussed Deacon showing Dante his work, though she had no doubt he would do it and enjoy it. She took a deep breath. 
Do you remember when you were asking me about your father a few months ago? Dante shrugged and took another bite of his burger before answering. Yeah, but you said you didn't know where he was. Well, that wasn't entirely true. I hadn't spoken to or seen him in years, but I had found him on social media. I wanted to make sure he was stable and in a good place before I introduced you to him. Dante tilted his head, as if trying to puzzle her halting words together. So, you know where he is now? Shonda glanced over at Deacon. I do. Dante, I'm not sure how to tell you this, but Mr. Deacon is your father. Dante blinked at her for a moment before turning to look back at Deacon. You're my father? It would seem so, Deacon said but I want you to know that I didn't know about you until the night I met you at your house. If I had, I would have come to you sooner. How could you not know? Dante asked. Shonda jumped in as a look of pain crossed Deacon's face. Deacon and I broke up before I found out I was pregnant. He moved and I lost track of him. And to be honest, I didn't look for him for a long time. That was wrong, and I'm sorry. I should have looked sooner. I should have told you sooner. Both of you. Dante stared at her for a moment before turning back to Deacon. You're really my dad? I am, and I'd really like to be in your life from now on, Deacon said. Slowly, a smile began to spread across Dante's face. My dad is a fireman? That's so cool. I can't wait to tell my friends. And then, as understanding set in, Dante's face fell. Wait, when we go back home, you won't go with us, will you? I... I don't... Deacon stumbled over his words and looked to Shonda for help. Dante, we haven't discussed that yet, Shonda said. I'm not even sure when we'll get to go home. So let's just stay, Dante said. You can get a job here, and I can make new friends. Friends who will never have to know I didn't know who my dad was. Shonda knew Dante didn't really know what he was saying, but the words still cut to her core. She had deprived him of a father for far too long. And why? Oh, she'd told herself it was because she was protecting him. But really, she'd been thinking about herself. She'd been afraid that Deacon would want her to move, or that he'd want to share custody of Dante, and she hadn't wanted that. Now she had a chance to make things right. Yes, it would mean leaving her job, but there wasn't much else keeping them in Baytown. We'll see, she finally said, but she could tell by the look of excitement on his face that he already considered it a done deal. This is so cool! Dante said, focusing all his attention on Deacon now. Can you take me to work and show me the fire trucks? And can you throw a football? I promise I will take you to the firehouse. And yes, I can throw a football. I even have one in the garage, Deacon said with a chuckle. And the look of sheer joy on his face warmed Shonda's heart. Yes, she'd been wrong to keep them apart but maybe it wasn't too late to salvage their relationship. And maybe everything that was going on in her life was God's way of showing her that. Mom, can we go throw the football now? Dante asked. Mr. Deacon says he has one in the garage. Of course you can, she said, trying to swallow the feelings of jealousy that were squeezing on her heart. When was the last time Dante had looked so excited to spend time with her? But she couldn't think like that. Deacon was his father, and she knew he was thrilled to have a man to do guy stuff with. I'll clean up here and then come and watch you. I can help you clean up first, Deacon offered, but Shonda shook her head. No, you guys have a lot of catching up to do. Go ahead, and I'll be out soon. Deacon lifted a brow and tilted his head. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Go have fun. She didn't have to tell him a third time. All right, then. Let's go. 
Shonda watched them go before gathering the plates and taking them to the sink. She thought about Deacon's reaction with a strange mix of excitement and anxiety. There was no doubt he would be a good father, so attentive and willing to give Dante the time he deserved. But where did she fit in? Could he give her a second chance? Was there a possibility they might become the family she'd always wanted? Or was that hoping too much? The thoughts tumbled around in her head as she finished cleaning up the kitchen. When everything was in its place, she went out into the backyard to watch them play football. The sun was still shining, though it had already begun its descent, and the air had cooled considerably. But that didn't seem to bother Dante, who was beaming with excitement as he ran around, trying to catch Deacon's passes. Every time he caught one, he would whoop and holler and perform some silly little dance. Shonda felt a rush of pride swell inside her chest, although part of her was also jealous that Deacon was able to make him so happy. Deacon had changed since the last time she'd seen him. He was still confident, but now it was a quiet confidence rather than a braggadocious one. He looked more relaxed, making his handsome features more prominent. And he'd definitely figured out an eating and workout plan that shredded his already lean physique and accentuated his muscles. She pulled her gaze from him as she felt the heat climb up her neck. Mom, did you see my catch? Dante asked as he ran past her. I sure did. Great job, honey. She continued to watch them toss the ball back and forth until it grew too dark to see. Can we do it again tomorrow, Mr. Deacon? Dante asked. I'm meeting up with someone to get some more of your things, but if I get back in time, and if it's okay with your mom, Deacon said, patting Dante on the shoulder. Dante turned his eager eyes on Shonda. Can we, Mom, if Mr. Deacon gets back in time? I don't see why not, but right now it's time to get cleaned up for bed. Oh man, Dante said, but the words didn't hold the usual whine. They were said more out of habit than out of passion, and she wondered if spending this time with Deacon had anything to do with that. Get your jammies on and I'll be right there, Shonda said, as they stepped back into the house. Can Mr. Deacon help put me to bed? Dante asked looking up at Deacon. Shonda felt the strings pull a little tighter on her heart. Sure, if he's up for it. Deacon grinned. You might have to tell me what to do, but I'm definitely up for it. All right, back in a bit. Dante spun and raced down the hall to the spare bedroom. I've never seen him so excited for bedtime, Shonda said. Deacon placed a hand on her arm. Hey just because it's new. Once he gets used to the idea of me, the novelty will wear off, but you will always be his mom. Shonda sighed. Yeah, it's just, it's always just been the two of us. I'm not used to not being the one he wants. Deacon opened his mouth to speak, but Dante beat him to it as he raced back down the hall. I'm ready, Mr. Deacon. Okay, well, then let's go. Mom usually makes me read, but I didn't bring a book with me. Do you think you can pick one up when you get our stuff? My favorite is the ones with the dragons. Deacon smiled and nodded. I like dragons too. I'll be sure and tell them to grab some books. Shonda followed behind the two, but she felt like a ghost. Dante barely even looked at her. He climbed into the bed and then stared up at Deacon. Since I don't have a book tonight, how about I just pray for you? Dante nodded and glanced over at Shonda. Mom always prays for me, too. Deacon smiled up at her before looking back at Dante. I bet she does. Your mom is a special woman. And a great mom, Dante said with a yawn. Those words warmed Shonda's heart, and she watched Deacon pray over Dante with tears in her eyes. It didn't take long for Dante to pass out, And when he was asleep and snoring lightly, they both tiptoed out of the room and returned to the living room. Thank you for today, he said, grabbing her hand. She glanced down at the touch that sent tingles racing up her arm. 
Then she lifted her gaze to meet his eyes. She felt as if she could drown in their chocolatey depths. You're welcome. I'm so sorry I waited so long. He shook his head. It's okay. I'm sad for all the time I've missed, but I do understand your reasons. I wasn't in a good place the last time I saw you, and I know you were just being protective. Shonda pressed her lips together and sighed. That was part of it, but there was more. And as hard as it was, if she wanted this to be something lasting, then she needed to tell him everything. His hands moved to her arms and he rubbed them up and down. What is it? What's wrong? It's just, I followed your career. I mean, not at first, but when Dante first asked about his father when he was four, I looked you up. I knew then that you'd changed, that you'd gotten everything together and that you'd be a great father. But I was afraid you'd take him away. It was selfish, and I'm so sorry. Her voice hitched as a tear made its way out of the corner of her eye and down her cheek. She dropped her eyes to the floor in shame. Deacon placed a finger under her chin and lifted her face to meet his. Then he wiped the tear away, leaving a trail of fire on her face. Hey, it's okay. God has a purpose for everything. And I don't know what his purpose was in this, but I trust that he had reasons. I don't blame you. She stared up at him, humbled by his grace for her. And then before she could think about what she was doing, she wrapped her arms around his neck and leaned up to kiss him. It was tentative at first, soft, but as if her lips remembered all the times they'd done this before, it soon evolved into a more passionate kiss hungry, as if it could devour all the lost years. Emotions exploded within her, and she forced herself to break the kiss, before they made the same mistake they'd made years before. She didn't know if they had a future, but if they did, she wanted to do it right this time. Her breath was ragged as she pulled back, but so was Deacon's. I'm sorry, I should have... He shook his head, cutting her off. It's fine. I've wanted to do that since the first day I saw you. She smiled and ran her hands along his shoulders, enjoying the feel of the muscles beneath. You have? He nodded. I'd put you out of my mind, but I don't think I ever got over you. I haven't had a real relationship since, and I don't know whether that was because I compared every woman to you or because somewhere deep down I hoped we'd get a second chance. But the moment I saw you again, all I wanted to do was kiss you. A soft chuckle escaped Shonda's lips. His words were like a mirror of her own feelings. Me too, but what does this mean? Well, I guess that depends on you and your plans for the future, Deacon said, pulling her tighter against him. Maybe we just take it slow and see where it goes. Take it slow. She liked that idea. She just had no idea if they'd actually be able to do it. Chapter 16 Deacon Deacon checked the time on the car as he neared the meetup spot. He was a little early, but that was fine with him. It would give him time to check out the area. Baytown was a good five hours from Fire Beach, so he'd picked a spot about halfway in between. One he thought would be busy enough to be safe, but it never hurt to check it again. As he pulled into the parking lot of the Walmarts they'd agreed to meet at, the hairs on the back of his neck stood up. He glanced around. The parking lot was about half full, not as much as he would have liked, but better than empty. There was a large container off to the side advertising a donation drop-off center. Across the street were two fast-food restaurants that were bustling, and a grocery store with a half-full parking lot was visible as well. There were few places to hide, so why did he have the feeling that someone was watching him? He decided to check out the donation container. It was the only place he could think of that someone could be hiding behind. Easing the car forward, he cleared the container, but there was nothing on the other side. Maybe it was just nerves getting the better of him. As he headed back for the meetup spot, he saw his truck pull in the parking lot. 
He'd appreciated the use of the car, but he was glad to be getting his truck back. Eric had told him that he was sending someone he could trust, a young guy with blonde hair and a heart for fixing all the wrong in the world. Tim was his name, and he'd be wearing a blue shirt so that Deacon would know it was the right guy. The truck pulled to a stop, and the guy stepped out. When Deacon saw the blue shirt, he stepped out as well. Deacon? the guy asked. Deacon nodded. That's me. What's your name? I'm Tim. Eric sent me. Deacon nodded again, but even though Tim was saying all the right things, something still bothered him. Are the keys in the truck? Yep. Your keys in the car? They are. Deacon began walking toward Tim, keeping his senses alert for any sound or movement that didn't belong. Tim held out his hand as Deacon neared. Good to meet you, man. I hope I grabbed everything you guys needed. Deacon shook Tim's hand. Good to meet you, too. I'm sure you did great. Tell Eric thanks for me. You bet. Tim smiled and released Deacon's hand, and that's when he heard it, the crack of a gunshot. The bullet whizzed by his right arm and grazed Tim's left, leaving a spreading trail of red on his arm. What the? But Tim didn't get to finish that sentence as another bullet flew past them. Come on, Deacon said, grabbing him and throwing him into the truck. Deacon scanned the area one more time, but he couldn't tell where the bullet had come from other than behind him. Is it bad? He asked as he closed his door and fired up the truck. Tim grimaced but shook his head. I'll live. Who the heck is shooting at us? I don't know, but we have to get out of here. A bullet hit the back window, shattering the glass and causing both of them to jump. Deacon pressed the accelerator and peeled out. From the corner of his eye, he saw movement near the donation container and realized the shooter had probably been hiding inside. He just hoped there wasn't another one in a vehicle waiting to follow them. He checked his mirror as he pulled onto the road, but there was no immediate movement. How did he even know where we were meeting? Tim asked, glancing behind them as well. There's only three ways I can think of. Either you're working with them, Eric is, or they're monitoring the phones. Tim's face paled as he realized the implications. It's not me, I promise. Deacon spared him a glance. The kid was young, but he seemed earnest. However, if he was telling the truth... That narrowed the possibilities down to just two. Deacon didn't want to suspect Eric. He had lost touch with him, but he just couldn't believe the man would try to get him killed. But if it wasn't Eric, who would know to monitor his phone? How well do you know Eric? Deacon asked as he drove. He wasn't as familiar with this town, so he hoped he'd find what he was looking for before he got them both lost. The kid shrugged. I've only been on the job for six months, so about that long. Eric was the one who took me under his wing, though, and showed me the ropes. Do you really think he could have done this? Deacon shook his head. No, until recently I hadn't spoken to him in years, but the man I knew was a good man. Deacon pressed his lips together as he tried to make sense of the situation. Did Eric call you on the phone or ask you in person to do the exchange? He asked me in person in his office. Was it possible? Did they have Eric's office bugged? If whoever was behind this knew that Eric was looking into them, it would make sense. Do you have Eric's cell number? Tim nodded. Yeah, why? You want me to call him? Are you sure that's safe? There's one way to find out. Call him on his cell. Tell him to get out of his office before you say anything else. Then ask him to meet us at Hodgins Park. A park? That's pretty open. Won't that leave us sitting ducks if it is him? If I remember correctly, there's a place we can set up where we'll see anyone coming in, but have the ability to leave quickly if necessary. It had been years since Deacon had stopped at this park, but he hoped it hadn't changed much. Tim nodded. Okay, I'll trust you. I don't know this area at all, but I hope this works. It better... Deacon said, checking his mirrors again. I don't really have another idea. 
While Tim made the call, Deacon searched for a drugstore to get some items to patch Tim up. He'd need to get medical attention later to avoid an infection, but some ointment and gauze would do for now. Okay, he said he was leaving now, but that still means two hours, right? Unless he speeds. Tim nodded. I just hope we didn't summon the wolf to the hen house. Deacon sighed as he pulled into the drugstore parking lot. I hope so, too. Be right back. Gonna run in and grab some first aid for your scratch. Tim glanced down at his arm and grimaced again. Grab some Tylenol, too. Deacon hurried into the store, grabbing the items he needed off the shelf and paying at the register. Then he was back in the truck and heading toward the park. When they got there, he parked the truck so they could see every arrival before he began doctoring Tim's wound. Keep an eye out front and let me know if you see anything. You got it. Deacon finished and sat back in the seat. As there was still no sign of Eric or anyone else, he decided to find out more about Tim. Did Eric tell you anything about dirty cops? Tim shook his head. No, I'm not in his inner circle, and I don't think I've been there long enough for everyone to trust me, but I've heard some rumors. Is that what this is about? Maybe. The stuff you picked up for me is my friend's. She witnessed a drug deal, but evidently someone connected to the force is trying to cover it up. Tim let out a low whistle. Wow, I guess this is just another reminder to keep my ears open and my head down. That's always a good plan, Deacon said. The two continued to chat until an approaching car caught Deacon's eye. He nodded toward the window. There he is, and he looks like he's alone. Eric's sleek orange Mustang was hard to miss, but it appeared to be alone, as did Eric when he stepped out of the car. You can stay inside if you want, Deacon said as he opened his door. Nah, I'm good. Tim opened his door as well, and the two cautiously approached Eric. Eric's eyes widened when he saw the bandage on Tim's arm. What happened? Someone was there waiting for us, Deacon said. They started shooting as soon as we made the exchange. Good thing they weren't a very good shot, or neither one of us might have made it out of there alive. But how did they... Eric's words faltered as his eyes widened. You don't think I tipped them off, do you? There aren't many other options, Deacon said, folding his arms across his chest. That's why I wanted to meet. I needed to see your reaction. I promise you, Deacon, I'm on your side. Deacon stared at him a little longer, but he didn't get the feeling that Eric had betrayed him. Instead, he once again felt peace. He sighed. I believe you, which means we're left with only one other option. Someone has either your office or your phone bugged. Eric blinked a few times as if he couldn't believe this was a possibility, but then he began to nod. I should have thought about that. I should have checked my office. As soon as I began asking questions, I should have known they would start looking for ways to shut me down. It's not your fault, but it does mean you should be more careful. Deacon turned to look at Tim. Both of you. We will. Eric shook his head. Somehow I fear this goes even higher than we thought. Deacon had no doubt he was right about that. Thanks for all you've done. Any more word on the guys who chased us to the warehouse? Eric sighed. No, I wish I did. They're still not talking. But I have no doubt someone sent them there. I just don't know who. If she decides not to come back, would you be able to help coordinate a moving company? Of course. I don't want to know where you're staying, but I'll keep in touch if this ever goes to court. Sounds good. Deacon turned to Tim and held out his hand. I'll leave you in the hands of this guy, but thank you for picking up these items and risking your life. Tim smiled and returned the shake. All in a day's work, am I right? It shouldn't be, but until Jesus returns... Yeah, I guess it is. Deacon shook hands with Eric as well, before climbing back in his truck and heading home. Chapter 17 Shonda Shonda breathed a sigh of relief when she heard Dante shout excitedly, There he is! Deacon had texted her to let her know he'd run into trouble, 
but she had been unable to fully relax until she knew he was safe. And poor Dante had been sitting next to the window all afternoon waiting for Deacon to return. As soon as the front door opened, Dante raced over to Deacon. Mr. Deacon, what took so long? Did you get our stuff? I did, and I'm sorry it took me so long. Everything all right? Shonda asked, stepping forward. Mostly, we can talk about it later, Deacon said. For now, I could use some help with the bags. I'll help too, Dante said, pulling his shoulder back and puffing out his little chest. Of course, the man of the house always helps, Deacon said, smiling down at him. Dante grinned and then turned to Shonda. Did you hear that, Mom? I'm the man of the house. Well, Mr. Deacon is the man of this particular house, but yes, you are becoming quite the little man. She followed them outside to Deacon's truck and helped bring in the bags. Can we go throw the football now? Dante asked when they'd brought all the bags in. In a minute, I need to talk to your mom for just a second. Okay, I'll go outside and warm up. Dante grabbed the football and raced outside. Well, I'm certainly happy to see him wanting to play outside more than wanting to be on his computer game, Shonda said, as she watched him throw the ball and then run after it. Me too. Look, someone shot at us at the meetup site. I don't think Eric or Tim, the guy he sent to meet me, tipped them off, so I'm pretty sure Eric's office is bugged. I don't know what you want to do with the rest of your things, but I'm afraid Fire Beach needs to be your home for a while. Shonda sighed and stepped closer to him. I suspected as much, and while I love being close to you and especially giving Dante more time with you, I don't think I should stay here long term. I'll start looking for a job, but do you think you can put up with us until I make enough to move out? Deacon grabbed her hands and squeezed them. You are welcome to stay as long as you like, your family, and I promise that no matter how long you stay, we won't cross any boundaries unless we've exchanged vows. She looked up at him, wanting to ask if he saw that in the future. It was too soon right now, she knew that, but if it was on his mind, she would wait for as long as it took. Still, it didn't seem right to ask at the moment, so she just smiled and nodded. I'll go toss the ball with Dante for a bit, but then I'd like to take you to the firehouse to meet everyone, and then to the hospital to see if they have any openings. Would you be willing to do that? Of course, and thank you, Deacon, for everything. He smiled, checked the backyard to make sure Dante couldn't see, and then pulled her in for a quick kiss that left her wanting more. She watched him walk outside and then turned to unloading the bags they'd brought in. It was odd that she didn't have much here, and yet she didn't find herself missing anything. With the bags unpacked, she headed outside to watch them toss the football around. She'd worried that Dante would be mad at her for not telling him about Deacon sooner, or that he'd be distant from his father, but he'd accepted him immediately. Evidently, he'd been more starved for fatherly attention than she'd even known, But she was glad that he had Deacon now. As much as his life was in upheaval right now, having Deacon around seemed to balance some of that so that his smile never faltered. She just hoped it would last if they had to stay here for good. Okay, let's take a break, Deacon said as they walked toward her. I want to show you guys the firehouse and introduce you to my other family. Dante's eyes grew wide. Will I get to see the fire truck? Up close and personal, buddy. All right. Will I get to ride in it? We'll see. Dante continued to fire questions the whole ride to the fire station, but Deacon never looked annoyed or frustrated. In fact, it was a look of pride that shone from his countenance every time Shonda glanced at him. It faltered only slightly when he pulled into the parking lot of the fire station. You okay? She whispered. Yeah, I just haven't told anyone about Dante yet. We'll probably get some strange looks. We can wait if you're not ready. Deacon shook his head. 
No way. I'm proud to be a dad. Just wanted to warn you in case anyone asks. Can we go now? Dante asked, looking from Deacon to Shonda. Deacon chuckled. Yeah, let's go, little man. They entered the firehouse with Dante in between them, his eyes widening as soon as they stepped into the open bay. Wow, you get to ride in these? Sure do. Sometimes I even get to drive them. Whoa. Suddenly, a man appeared from around the truck. He was thick and muscular, just like Deacon. Deacon, is that you? When did you get back, man? Hey, Luca, just yesterday, I brought back some friends and wanted to introduce them to everyone, as they might be around for a while. Luca lifted an eyebrow as he glanced at Shonda and Dante. Oh, yeah? Yep, this is Shonda and her son, Dante. I'm your son, too, Mr. Deacon, Dante piped up. Yes, you are. Long story, Deacon said to Luca, before he could ask any questions. Well, I'm happy to meet you both. Would you like a tour? You bet we would, Dante shouted. Come on, then, Luca said with a smile as he led the way. Shonda and Deacon stayed a little behind, stopping every time someone new appeared so that she could be introduced. Everyone seemed nice, though Shonda had no idea how she would be able to remember everyone's names. When can we come back? Dante asked, when they were finally able to drag him out an hour later. Deacon chuckled as they climbed into the truck. Soon, I promise. First, we need to stop by the hospital and see if we can get your mom a job. Dante turned to look up at her. If you get a job, does that mean we're staying here? Would you like that? Dante scrunched his face for a minute as he thought. I'd miss a few of my friends, but I'd miss my dad more if we moved back. So, yeah, I think I'd like to stay. Well, then let's go see what we can do about that, Shonda said with a smile. Deacon pulled into the parking lot of the hospital a few minutes later. It was an older brick building built in the early 1960s, but still full of life, towering and imposing against the sky. She had never been there before, and the sight of it filled her with a mixture of awe and apprehension. Deacon squeezed her hand reassuringly, and they stepped onto the wide cobblestone path that led to the entrance. The walkway was lined with cobalt blue planters full of carefully tended flowers, their bright petals almost glowing in the late summer sun. Beyond the planters, marble pillars framed the entrance, the ornate carvings of medicine, science, and discovery adorning their sides. Shonda felt a thrill as they approached the double doors, pushing them open and entering the main lobby. The room was brightly lit, with large windows and cream-colored marble floors. There were clusters of chairs, couches, and tables scattered throughout, and two elevators in the corner. The air was heavy with the bustle of activity and the muted voices of doctors and nurses discussing patient care. Whoa, this place is cool too, Dante said as he took in the area. Deacon led the way through the lobby. As they walked, Shonda felt her apprehension begin to fade in the face of the hospital's inviting atmosphere. This was a place of healing and hope, and suddenly, she could sense its power to make people feel better, to give them a second chance. Deacon stopped at the entrance to the cafeteria and gestured for them to go in ahead of him. What are we doing here? Well, if you're thinking about working here, you'll probably have to eat here on occasion. I thought we should test out the food to make sure it's edible. Plus, I'm just hungry. Me too, Dante piped up. Shonda hesitated for a moment, taking in the sight of the long cafeteria tables and the bright orange walls adorned with posters about nutrition and healthy foods. Then she stepped in and immediately felt at home. The cafeteria was bustling with activity, filled with doctors, nurses, and other hospital staff chatting and eating their lunch. A few of them glanced up as she and Deacon entered, but for the most part, everyone seemed too busy to pay much attention. 
Deacon led them to a table near the window, and they sat down. He pushed a menu towards her and she opened it, her eyes widening at the array of delicious food. There were cereals, muffins, sandwiches, salads, steaks and chicken dishes, even desserts. Everything looked fresh and inviting, and Shonda couldn't help but smile as she read the descriptions. This is the cafeteria food? Hey, we don't skimp on taste in Fire Beach. I guess not. Can I have a pizza, Mom? Dante asked, looking up from his menu. Sure, hun. I think I'll try the soup and sandwich option. Deacon placed the order, and soon the scrumptious food was in front of them. Shonda's food was simple but delicious, and she felt a sense of comfort as they ate. It felt good to be in this place surrounded by people who were dedicated to making a difference. As the meal went on, she could feel her apprehension melting away, and the hospital began to feel like a second home. This is pretty good, Mom. If you get a job here, can you bring home leftovers? Dante asked around a mouthful of pizza. I wouldn't be working in the kitchen, and don't talk with your mouth full, she said, shaking her head. Sorry, but it's really good. Shonda knew it wasn't a done deal yet, but as she looked around the room, she could see herself working here. You ready to continue the tour? Deacon asked when their food was gone. I guess so. I'd love to see the pediatric ward if they'll let us. I'm not sure I know any doctors who work there, but maybe Brody or Nick could take you there if they're on today. He led the way out of the cafeteria. And while he didn't physically touch her, she could feel his presence next to her, comforting and reassuring. Shonda was struck by the beauty and energy of the place. She noticed the little details from the colorful murals on the walls to the cheerful music that played softly in the background. Everywhere she looked, there was evidence of healing and compassion. Deacon led them into the ER, but of course, a nurse at the desk stopped them. Can you tell me if Dr. Kavanaugh or Dr. Pearson are here? Deacon asked. Smiling at the woman. Dr. Kavanaugh is, but this is the ER. He doesn't take appointments. I know. My name is Deacon Jackson. I'm a firefighter. Can you just ask him if he has time to step out and give us five minutes? I'll see, but I can't promise anything. It has been slow, though, so maybe you'll be in luck. Thank you. We'll just be sitting over there. Deacon pointed to a few seats away from where the other people were sitting. We don't have to wait, Shonda said. I don't want to bother him if he's busy. If he's busy, then he won't come out. We can give him ten minutes or so. Okay, if you're sure. They sat down in the vinyl chairs, and Dante grabbed a magazine and began flipping through it. Shonda, however, took the time to scan the ER. She hadn't spent a lot of time in the ER back home, but she had filled in occasionally. This one didn't seem much different. The pace was still hectic, but something about the area felt different than the ER back home. Maybe it was all in her head. Maybe because she was hoping to stay, she was seeing things differently than she normally would. But was that really a bad thing? A few minutes later, a handsome doctor stepped out and headed toward them. Deacon, good to see you. To what do I owe this surprise visit? Hey, Brody, this is my friend Shonda. She's going to be in Fire Beach for the foreseeable future and is going to need a job. She was a pediatric nurse at her hospital back in Baytown, and I was hoping that you could tell us who to talk to and maybe put in a good word. Brody's brows lifted, and he chuckled, shaking his head. You aren't going to believe this, but I just saw a memo this morning asking for someone to cover pediatrics for a few months. Evidently, one of the nurses there is pregnant and needed to take extra time off due to some complications. Shonda's hand flew to her mouth. Oh no, is she going to be okay? Is the baby? I don't have any information beyond what I told you, but I know she's in good hands. Look, I gotta get back. But go see Diane in Human Resources. Tell her I sent you, and I'll send a recommendation when I'm done here. I can't guarantee anything, but if you're qualified, I know they need the help. 
I am. Thank you. Brody nodded, shook Deacon's hand again, and then disappeared back into the bowels of the ER. Well, I'd say God is providing, Deacon said, as he led the way toward human resources. Maybe, but I wish the circumstances were different. I hate the thought of getting hired because some other woman has complications. Deacon stopped and grabbed her arm. Hey, that's in God's hands, too. She looked at him, realizing that he'd changed in one other way, too. This one probably more important than the rest. He'd become much stronger in his faith, and Shonda knew she wanted to stay for even more reasons now. You're right, she said. Let's follow God's lead. The HR department here was nothing like the one back home. It wasn't relegated to the basement, and there were enough windows to keep it as well lighted as the rest of the hospital. Well, I have to tell you, compared to the dungeon back home, this place already feels better, she whispered to Deacon. A woman at the closest desk looked up with a friendly smile and waved them over. Hello, I'm Diane. What can I do for you? My name is Shonda, and I'm a pediatric nurse. I'm actually employed at Baytown Hospital, but had to take a leave of absence for safety reasons. Diane lifted an eyebrow, and Shonda worried she was making a terrible impression. Thankfully, Deacon stepped in. Hi, Diane. I'm Deacon Jackson with the Fire Beach Fire Department. Shonda witnessed a crime back in Baytown, and someone is after her, so I brought her here. My friend on the force in Baytown suggested she stay out of town for a while, so she's looking for a job here, and Dr. Kavanaugh told us you might be looking for a pediatric nurse. Diane narrowed her eyes at Deacon, clearly trying to decide if she should trust him. We might be. Brody promised to send over a recommendation when he gets off work. Deacon added with his charming smile. I'll be sure to look for it then, Diane said. Then she turned her attention to Shonda. I'm not saying we are, but if there is an open position, how long do you plan to stay in town? This question caught Shonda slightly off guard. They hadn't really discussed it. To be honest, I'm not sure, but... She looked over at Deacon. There are definitely reasons for me to stay long term. Diane looked from one to the other. Well, I'll need to look into your background records, but you can fill out an application for me. She pulled a piece of paper out of her drawer, attached it to a clipboard, and handed it to Shonda. Shonda bit the inside of her lip. If Diane spoke with Amy, then she doubted she would get hired. But if she explained the situation, would that make her look crazy? She glanced over at Deacon, but as if reading her mind, he nodded for her to go ahead. When you call my last job, will you speak to my direct supervisor? That's usually the way it's done, Diane said slowly. Why? The crime that I witnessed was evidently committed by someone who doesn't want it to come to light. I reported it to the police, but they told me I must have imagined it. And when I pushed, they forced me to attend therapy sessions. I went because I wanted to keep my job, but something wasn't right about it. I was supposed to be at another session today, and Amy, the HR rep there, told me that I'd be fired if I didn't attend these sessions. I know it sounds crazy and makes me sound unstable, but my boss, Aaron, will be able to back all of this up. I see. Well, why don't you still fill that out, and we'll see where it goes. Diane didn't appear convinced, but Shonda had to hope that she would still call Aaron and get the whole story. Thank you. Shonda took the application and sat down in a nearby chair to fill it out. Deacon and Dante sat next to her, and Deacon took charge of entertaining Dante so she could focus, which she greatly appreciated. When she finished filling it out, she returned it to Diane, praying that she would at least consider her. Chapter 18. Deacon It was dark when Deacon opened his eyes. 
The clock on the nightstand showed just after midnight, so why was he awake? He lay in bed for a moment, trying to figure out what had woken him, and then he heard it again, the soft sound of a whisper. It had to be Shonda, but who was she speaking with at this time of night? He squinted in the darkness, the room illuminated only by the faint silvery glow of moonlight and the tiny sliver of light creeping in through the cracked door. He tried to make out what she was saying, but her voice was too low and the words indistinguishable. He pushed back the sheets and padded over to the door. Opening it wider, he peered out and what he saw made his heart lurch in his chest. Shonda was standing in the hallway, her back to him, her body motionless, but it was the phone in her hand that struck fear in his chest. Who was she talking to? And why did her voice sound so robotic? Deacon crept towards her, wanting to make sure he did not startle her. He didn't know if she was sleepwalking or if something else was going on, but he knew you weren't supposed to scare a person if they were sleepwalking. Though at one time claims had been made that you should never wake them, More recent posts had simply recommended leading them back to bed, which was what he had planned to do until he heard her telling whoever was on the other end where they were. Why was she telling someone that information? The whole point of her and Dante being here was that no one would know where to find them, but that was out the window now. He had to know who she was talking to. If it was her family, that wouldn't be great but they probably wouldn't be after her. But if it was someone else? The thought died in his mind. She had to be talking to family or a friend. The other option was just too horrible. He reached out and touched her arm gently, and she immediately stopped talking and opened her eyes. She seemed startled and looked around the room, trying to comprehend what was going on. Deacon, she said, her voice shaking. What are you doing up? Without answering, he took the phone from her hand and held it to his ear. Who is this? He demanded, but the only answer he got was silence. Frustrated, he ended the call and turned back to Shonda. Who was that? Who did you call? I I didn't call anyone, she stammered. I don't even know why I'm out of bed. You were talking to someone, Shonda. You told them you were in Fire Beach. Who was it? Your family? Shonda shook her head, her eyes wide and fearful. I don't have any family, Deacon. My parents died a few years ago. A friend, then? Please tell me it was a friend. Deacon was frantically trying to pull up Shonda's call log on her phone, but his shaking fingers were making it difficult. I don't remember calling anyone, she said. I don't even remember getting out of bed. Can we check my phone? I'm trying. He managed to click the right button, and the number appeared on the screen. Hurrying back to his bedroom, he dialed Eric, hoping he would either be awake or not mind a late-night phone call. Deacon, what's up? Eric's voice was groggy, but he didn't sound angry. I need you to find out who is registered to this number. Deacon rattled it off. Okay, but couldn't this have waited until morning? No, because I just found Shonda talking to whoever this is and telling them where we are. She doesn't even remember making the phone call. I have a bad feeling that the therapist she was seeing used some form of hypnosis to put a suggestion in her head. It's the only thing that makes sense. Eric let out a low whistle and suddenly he sounded wide awake. Okay, you're right, that can't wait. I'll get someone on it and let you know right away. Are you guys safe where you are? Deacon shook his head. I have no idea, but tomorrow I'll check in with my friends on the force here and see what I can do about getting some police protection. Good idea. They probably won't be able to do much unless something happens, but it never hurts to have people aware, especially if you trust them. Until then, keep your eyes open, and I'll contact you as soon as I have information on this number. Thanks, Eric. Deacon hung up with Eric and stared down at the phone for a minute. He wanted to call Jordan, but it could probably wait until morning. 
Eric was right that Jordan wouldn't be able to do anything tonight anyway. With a sigh, Deacon stepped back into the hall, where Shonda was still waiting, twisting her hands together. Were you able to find out anything? Eric is looking into it, but he won't know anything for a few hours at least. We should probably get some rest. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? Shonda shook her head. I don't know if I can sleep. Who could I have called, Deacon? He pulled her close and wrapped his arms around her. I don't know, but I promise you we'll figure it out. She looked up at him and nodded. I'm so glad you're in my life again. Me too, he said, and leaned down to kiss her. Every fiber in his body wanted to take her back to his bed so he could make sure she was safe, but he wouldn't do that again. This time, they would do it right. He pulled back and stroked her face. Try to get some sleep. I'm going to finish the night in the living room just in case. Do you want company? She asked. He did, but he didn't want to tempt fate. Nor did he want Dante to wake up and find them together. He doubted the boy would be upset, but that was not the way to find out. I want you to get good sleep. One of us should be alert enough to entertain Dante tomorrow. Okay, if you're sure. He nodded, kissed her again, and then watched her walk back to the spare bedroom. He loved having her here, but it was going to be harder than he thought to keep firm lines in the sand. There was definitely going to be a lot of prayer in his future. After grabbing a blanket and pillow from his bed, he curled up onto the couch and closed his eyes. Sleep wasn't going to come right away, but that just meant he could start his prayer time now. The light and the ringing of his cell phone woke him from sleep a few hours later. He blinked at the screen and tapped the button when he realized it was Eric's number. Did you find out anything? I did. The number she called was the therapist's number. We did a little digging into him, and it turns out he has quite a few burner cells linked to his name. We need to know a little more before we go pick him up, but I'm fairly certain we'll find something we can use. I don't know how he's linked to the fentanyl issue yet, but I have no doubt that he is. Can you confirm he's still in town, that he didn't head out to come here after getting off the phone with her last night? He's still here, but I have no idea if he might have sent someone else out there. My advice is to keep your eyes open. This isn't over yet. Deacon sighed and ran a hand across the back of his neck. He wondered if this would ever really be over. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. You bet. Talk soon. Deacon ended the call and inhaled deeply, trying to wake himself up. He was already feeling the fatigue from the lack of sleep seeping into his bones. He rolled his tight shoulders ignoring the clicks and crunches that met his ears. Though he took good care of himself, the years and the demands of his job had wrecked havoc on his body, and sleeping on an uncomfortable couch did little to help. But there was no time to focus on that now. The weak sunlight of an early autumn day had already begun to fill the room, and soon so would Shonda and Dante, and he wanted to have breakfast ready for them when they got up. He rose from the couch, his joints protesting as he stretched the rest of his muscular frame and headed into the bathroom to get ready. The cold water he splashed on his face left him feeling a little more alive, and he quickly changed into a new outfit before heading back to the kitchen. Chapter 19 Shonda Shonda couldn't believe the dark circles under her eyes. She knew she hadn't slept well in the last few weeks, but she'd hoped once she got out of town that she would finally be able to relax a little. And she had, until last night. She still wondered who she could have called and why, but more than that, she wondered if she had put Dante and Deacon in danger again. Mom, I'm hungry, Dante said from the bed behind her. Me too. Let's go see what we can scrounge up for breakfast. She'd planned to make breakfast for Deacon and Dante, but as they stepped out of the room, she was hit with the smell of freshly brewed coffee, along with the comforting scent of cinnamon and apples. Mmm, it smells good, 
Dante said, racing ahead of her. Deacon was hard at work in the kitchen when they entered, flipping pancakes on a griddle. Morning, he said, as he glanced her way before scooping a pancake onto a plate. There's coffee in the pot if you'd like. Thank you, I could use some. As he handed a plate to Dante, she grabbed a mug from the cupboard and filled it with the dark liquid. Then she added just a little milk from the fridge. Normally, she took her coffee a little lighter, but she felt that she could use the extra jolt of darker coffee today. When she sat down at the table, Deacon slid a plate of pancakes in front of her before pulling out a chair and sitting down as well. I hope you guys are open to trying new things, he said, as he poured them each a glass of orange juice. New things? Dante asked. I've had pancakes before. Mom makes them on the weekends sometimes. Deacon smiled and shook his head. Not like these you haven't. Shonda wondered what he meant by that, but she didn't have time to ask before Deacon took her hand and bowed his head to pray. She joined in, glad that he kept his prayer short. The coffee hadn't kicked in yet, and her eyes still felt like lead weights. Grabbing the syrup, she looked around for the butter, but didn't see any on the table. Do you have butter? she asked. Deacon shook his head. Sorry, no butter. I went plant-based a while back and haven't bought any since. Dante's nose scrunched in disgust. Plant-based? Are you telling me you only eat plants? Deacon chuckled. Not like you mean, but yeah, basically. If it didn't come from a plant, I don't eat it. But then how'd you make the pancakes? Shonda asked, knowing they were generally made with eggs, oil, butter, lots of things that didn't come from plants. Honestly, it's just oats, bananas, and almond milk, plus some cinnamon and apple compote. I think you'll like it if you try it. We like trying new things, right, Dante? She lifted her eyebrows at her son, hoping he would take the hint and not complain. The scrunching of his nose said he was not convinced, but he nodded. I'm not sure I like bananas, but I'll try. Shonda poured a little of the maple syrup that was on the table on her pancakes and took a bite. While it wasn't the pancakes she was used to, the taste wasn't bad, and she was pleased to see Dante's face relax as he chewed as well. Hey, these aren't bad, he said when he finished chewing. Deacon smiled. I told you they weren't bad. I know, but sometimes adults say that just to get you to eat it, but then it's gross. Deacon chuckled. They do that because they know it's good for you. But I promise I'll always try to be honest with you. His phone began ringing, and Shonda wondered if it was his work calling. What would she do when he had to go to work? She didn't have a car or know her way around Fire Beach very well. She supposed she should have asked about that sooner, but instead of telling her he had to go, he handed the phone to her. It's Diane at the hospital. Though surprised, she took the phone and moved away from the table. Normally, she wouldn't take a call during mealtimes, but this was important. Hello? Shonda, this is Diane. I wanted to see if you could come in for an interview today. Really? She'd prayed that Diane would give her a chance, but a part of her had been convinced it would never happen. Yes, really. I spoke with your boss this morning, and she had nothing but glowing things to say about you. Besides, I spent a lot of time in prayer last night, and I felt that God was telling me I should take a chance on you. So while the hiring isn't up to me, I would love for you to interview. Shonda's eyes filled with tears. God had listened to her prayers after all. Thank you so much. What time should I be there? Can you be here by 2 p.m.? Absolutely. Thank you again. Well, don't thank me yet. You still have to convince the doctors who are on the interview team. Interviews always made Shonda nervous, 
and interviews with multiple people were even more nerve-wracking. But she was determined to ace this one. I'll be there. She just hoped that Deacon could either drop her off or tell her how to get a bus. Well, how did it go? Deacon asked when she returned. She handed the phone back to him and sat down to finish her pancakes, hoping they hadn't gotten too cold. I have an interview at 2 p.m. Will you either be able to take me or tell me how to get there by bus? A wide smile lit up Deacon's face. Of course I will. How about we swing by the school, too, to see about getting Dante registered? Ah, uh, do I have to go back to school? Yes, you do. If you and your mom are going to be here for a while, and it looks like you are, then you have to get back to school. Dante rolled his eyes but nodded. Okay. Do you think we can stop by a used car lot, too? Shonda asked. I don't have a lot of money, but I'd like to see about getting something inexpensive until I can get my car back. We can look, but I have a motorcycle in my garage. I could use that, and you could use my truck until we get your car back. Dante's eyes widened. You have a motorcycle, too? Can I ride on it? No, Shonda and Deacon said at the same time. She smiled at him before turning to Dante. Not until you're older, and I can't take your truck, Deacon. What if you need it? Well, I do have friends who could give me a ride if I needed it. But if you really don't feel comfortable taking my truck, I could see about having your car shipped here. That would probably be cheaper than buying a new one. She took a bite of the pancake and thought as she chewed. That's true, but what if whoever is watching the house follows the shipping company? Well, I don't think there's much of a chance of that. I am certainly willing to help you in any way I can, Deacon said. He finished his pancake and then sipped his coffee. How about after breakfast, we stop by the school, the car lot, and then spend some time driving around town so you can familiarize yourself before the interview this afternoon? Shonda nodded, realizing once again how lucky she was to have a man like Deacon. I'd like that. Chapter 20 Shonda Shonda tried to swallow her nerves as Deacon pulled up to the hospital for her first day of work. They'd called to tell her she had the job just hours after she'd interviewed two days ago, but it still felt surreal. She'd never imagined leaving Baytown, yet here she was about to start a new job in Fire Beach. And while things were going well with Deacon, she would definitely be saving her money so she and Dante could find a place of their own, even if it was only temporary. If she and Deacon were going to last this time, she didn't want to make the same mistake they'd made last time, and it was getting harder every day not to fall into that. Hey, you're going to do great, he said, placing a hand on her arm. Yeah, Mom, don't worry, Dante added. You're the best nurse ever. Aw, oh, thank you both. That's so sweet. She took a deep breath and opened the door. Will you still come meet me for lunch? Deacon grinned and nodded. We wouldn't miss it for the world. You just let me know what time and we'll be there. Sounds good. Have fun, you two. She stepped out of the truck and waved to them. Though she was glad Deacon had been able to take the day off to hang out with Dante, she wondered how he would adjust when both she and Deacon were working. They'd toured the school he would be attending a few days ago, and he'd seemed excited, but she still worried about him. He'd had so much turmoil lately in his young life, which was partly why she'd decided to leave him out the rest of this week and just start him on Monday. She just hoped he found friends soon, he hadn't talked about missing Baytown, but she feared that he would soon. Of course, finding friends was also something she needed to do. She hadn't had that many close friends back home, but she had a few, and while she had Deacon here, she really wanted to find more. Hopefully, she would meet some people here at the hospital that she could connect with. 
It was clearly where God wanted her to be at the moment. Though she was still a little nervous, she pulled back her shoulders and stepped through the entrance. Just like the previous two times she'd been in this hospital, she felt a sense of peace as she walked through the main area and to the HR offices. Good morning, Miss Turner, Diane said as she entered the office. Shonda smiled, pleased that the woman seemed to remember her face, even though they'd only met once. Good morning, Diane. How is your day so far? Better than I deserve, so I can't complain. Shonda didn't know Diane well, but she wondered if her sunny optimism was natural or more from habit. I've got your badge ready for you, and Dr. Young will assign you a locker when you get up there. I'm glad everything worked out with the interview. Me too, and thank you again for taking a chance on me. Shonda took the badge that Diane held out for her and stared down at the picture. It was her face, but she could still see the fear in her eyes. Would she ever feel completely safe again? There had been no word from Eric for a few days, but Shonda still worried about who she had called that night and if she would do it again. You're welcome. Have a great day. She thanked Diane and flashed a small smile before heading upstairs to the pediatric unit. Just like at her last hospital, this floor was decorated in bright colors and murals. No kid should be in the hospital, but at least they tried to make the place warm and welcoming. She approached the nurse working the desk and showed her badge. I'm reporting for work, but it's my first day. I'm supposed to meet with Dr. Young. The woman behind the desk smiled. Welcome, I'm Renee, and you will just love Dr. Young. He's so good with the kids and sweet. Plus, he's got the faintest accent. I just love to hear him talk. It was clear that Renee had a little crush on Dr. Young, but Shonda just smiled and nodded. Hospital romances weren't exactly sanctioned, but they happened so often that they weren't really frowned upon anymore either, as long as the parties involved could stay professional at work and cordial if they ended things. Well, I'm sure the kids enjoy it too. Oh, they do. Have a seat and I'll buzz him to let him know you're here and welcome to the team. I just know you'll love it here. Like Diane, Renee seemed to bubble with cheerfulness. Was it something in the water, or was this place really one big happy family? She'd barely sat down when the door opened, and a man in a blue lab coat stepped out. While not her type, she could understand Renee's fascination with him. He had dark hair and intense blue eyes, a dimple in his cheek when he smiled, and though his clothes didn't show it, she suspected he was muscular as well. Shonda Turner, he held out his hand. Yes, sir, that's me, she said, taking his hand and injecting as much confidence into the handshake as she could. Perfect. Let's get you situated so you can get to work. We've been a little behind since losing our last nurse. Shonda nodded. Happy to help, then. Is she doing okay? I heard about the reason for her absence. Dr. Young shrugged as he led her through the internal door that led to the rest of the pediatric wing. She's on bed rest due to her amniotic fluid being so low, but they're monitoring her and everything should be fine. Oh, that's so good to hear. Indeed. He stopped in front of a small break room that held little more than a table with chairs, a sink, a few fridges, and a couple of microwaves. This is the break room. You're welcome to eat in here or down at the cafeteria. Feel free to use the fridges, but be sure to label anything you don't want eaten. We're pretty good about only eating what we bring, but every once in a while, someone forgets and hunger strikes. She smiled. I know all about that, sir. I'll be sure to have my name on anything I bring. Wonderful. He continued to the next room. In here are the bathrooms, showers, and lockers. You're free to use these at any time. He stepped inside and took her back to the locker area. I've got number 113 cleaned out for you. Did you bring a lock with you? I did. 
She had to run to the hardware store on her way here because she hadn't had time to grab her lock from her old job, but she was good to go now. Perfect. He gave her a moment to stash her things and then continued the tour. Here's where you'll be stationed. You probably met Yolanda when you interviewed. He pointed to the pretty black woman who'd felt like an instant friend to Shonda when they'd met. She hoped the other woman felt the same way. I did. Good to see you again, Yolanda. You too, girl. Glad you're here. I'll take it from here, boss. Dr. Young nodded and then grabbed a chart before heading off to check on a patient. Most of this probably won't be new to you since you've done this before, but I'll walk you through anything you need in our computer system. Otherwise, you're shadowing me today with patients. Tomorrow, you'll be on your own. Sounds perfect. Thank you. Shonda followed Yolanda through all the rounds. Though the hospital did a few things differently than her last place, most of it was the same, and she found herself itching to help the clients on her own. Don't worry, you'll get your chance, Yolanda said, picking up on Shonda's eagerness as they returned to the desk after checking on a sweet young girl. Her smile faltered as her eyes locked on to something behind Shonda. She turned, expecting to see a patient out of their room, or someone destroying the hall or something. Instead, she found Renee sauntering their direction. Renee barely even looked at them as she breezed past, hips swaying side to side. But the air immediately around Yolanda seemed to drop 10 degrees. It was clear her friend didn't like the other woman for some reason. You want to tell me what that was about? Shonda asked, when Renee disappeared down the hallway. Yolanda pressed her lips together and then shook her head. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. She glanced down at her wrist and then smiled. Looks like it's time for lunch. Aren't you meeting your man? Shonda wanted to ask more questions, but her stomach chose that moment to let out a low rumble reminding her that she hadn't eaten in a few hours. Plus, Deacon and Dante would be waiting for her. Whatever was going on with Renee could be addressed later. Yes, and my son. Back in half an hour? Take 45 minutes, girl. We're not that busy, and it's your first day. Thank you. I'll be back soon. As Shonda made her way toward the cafeteria, the rumblings in her stomach grew more pronounced. Thankfully, the cafeteria didn't look especially busy, and they were already at a table when she entered. Dante spotted her first and waved his little arm to grab her attention. Smiling, she headed that direction and slid into one of the open chairs. How's your first day going? Deacon asked as she picked up the menu. Good. Busy, but good. I hadn't realized how much I miss helping kids but it feels good to be back at it. What have you guys been up to? Mr. Deacon took me to the coolest park. It has this huge slide where you have to climb lots of stairs to get to the top. It was a little scary at first, but once I went down it, I wasn't scared anymore, so I went down a lot. She smiled at Dante. That sounds fun. Her eyes shifted to Deacon and her eyebrow lifted just slightly. It's safe, right? Completely, he said with a grin. If you know what you want, I'll go place the order. Yeah, I think I'll take the pesto chicken today. Great, be right back. As Deacon headed off to place the order, Shonda turned to Dante, eager to hear more about this adventurous park they'd gone to. So tell me more about the park. What else did you do? Dante scrunched up his nose and thought for a moment before speaking. Well, there were some cool ninja warrior type activities. There was a rope ladder walk that was fun and a rock wall that I climbed easily. But I'm not very good at the monkey bars yet, he said, his mouth turning down into a slight frown. Shonda smiled and reached over to pat him on the back comfortingly. I never was either, honey but it sounds like you had fun. I did. He pressed his lips together, and she could tell there was something else on his mind. What is it? 
Did something happen? Though she didn't want them to and didn't believe them for a minute, images of Deacon not watching him and him getting hurt flew through her mind. Dante shook his head. No, nothing like that. I was just... He paused again before taking a deep breath. I was just wondering if I could call Mr. Deacon Dad. Oh. She didn't know why that question threw her off guard. She should have known it would be coming soon. What kid wants to call their father Mr. Anything? And they had been spending a lot of time together. But it still felt fast. I really want to call him Dad, but I didn't know if it would hurt your feelings, and I didn't want to do that. Those words broke Shonda's heart. How could she even think of telling him no? It didn't matter how long Dante had known Deacon. The man was his father, and he was a good man, a man she hoped to spend her life with. Denying Dante the right to call him dad would be nothing more than trying to soothe her jealousy. She placed a hand on his arm. I think if you're ready to call him dad, then you should. Immediately, Dante's posture brightened and his eyes lit up, letting her know she'd made the right decision. Really? You'd be okay with it? Of course. I happen to hope your father will be in our lives for many years to come. Cool. Thanks, Mom. You're the best. Deacon returned at that moment and slid back into his chair. What did I miss? Shonda glanced over at Dante. Well, Dante was just telling me about all the activities at the park. I'd love to check it out myself sometime, but I think he has something he wants to say too. Deacon turned his attention to Dante. Oh yeah? What's that? Dante looked down at his hands and chewed on his lip for a minute before meeting Deacon's eyes. I was wondering if you'd be okay with me calling you dad. Be okay with it? Are you kidding? I would love it. Cool. Thanks, Dad. As Deacon beamed and Dante's smile grew to match, Shonda felt that little seed of ugly jealousy try to rear its head again. This was what she'd always wanted for her son, and Deacon had missed so much, as had Dante growing up without his dad around. She would not ruin this for them. Maybe next time we can all go to the park together, Shonda offered as she watched the two men in her life bond in a way she would never understand. Deacon turned to her then and nodded. Absolutely. It will be even better when we're all together. It was clear that he understood what she was feeling, and she was grateful that he was including her. So what do you two have planned for the rest of the day? Mr. Deacon... I mean, Dad, Dante grinned up at him, said he'd play Mario with me. Ah, well, did you tell him how good you are? She'd played with Dante a few times, and it always amazed her how dexterous he was. She supposed it was because he grew up with computers. He did, but I still think I have a shot, Deacon said, smiling at Dante. Just then, the waitress came with their lunch orders, and conversation shifted away from the park as they dug into their food. It was only a momentary reprieve from the constant worry that nagged at Shonda, but she reminded herself to enjoy it before she had to let them both go and trust that they would all be okay. Chapter 21 Deacon Deacon smiled as Dante whooped with joy and danced around the living room. Woo-hoo! That's three games I've won. You want to try again? You play one without me, Deacon said. I need a break, and maybe watching you will show me what I need to be doing. He hadn't played video games in forever, so he knew his problem was being rusty. But he didn't want to admit that to Dante. He was having too much fun bonding with the kid. His kid. Deacon shook his head, still unable to fully comprehend that Dante was his son. 
And of course, he knew that Shonda and Dante would have to find their own place soon. But he was endlessly glad for the time he had with his son now. As he watched Dante play, he wondered if they really did have to move out. He hadn't really considered proposing marriage quickly to Shonda, but now he wondered why not. He certainly hadn't loved anyone since her. He'd never really gotten over her. And while he wasn't certain, he suspected she felt the same way. Plus, they'd planned to marry all those years ago. Why not finish what they'd started? Before he could wander down that dangerous rabbit hole further, his phone rang. When he saw it was Eric's number, he stepped out of the room as he answered. Hey, Eric, do you have some news? I do. We picked up Dr. Nelson today. It turns out he is distantly related to Governor Goldman, who also happens to have a son with a drug problem. Wait, are you telling me that the fentanyl exchange Shonda witnessed involved Governor Goldman's son? No wonder the man had tried so hard to cover it up, if that was the case. Though he wasn't directly responsible for the amount of fentanyl coming into Illinois, he certainly hadn't done much to stop it, and his son being involved wouldn't look good when it came time for re-election, which was less than a year away. It looks that way. We picked him up, too. Of course, he's not speaking yet, and Daddy has hired the best lawyers, but we managed to find video footage of the deal, so we're hoping it will be enough. So Dr. Nelson was brought in to do what, exactly? Find out what Shonda knew, or make her believe she was crazy? Maybe a little of both. He's not saying much right now, but his financials show that he has a gambling problem. My guess is that Goldman asked him to help clean up the problem and offered to pay off his debts, and Dr. Nelson couldn't say no. Do you know if he was hypnotizing or drugging Shonda? Deacon doubted the man would admit to that even if he was, but he had to know what had been done to her so he could help her fix it. I don't know yet. We're still looking into it. If there is a hypnotherapist you trust where you are, you might see about getting her an appointment. They might be able to answer your questions. Deacon didn't know any such person off the top of his head, but he had a bet that Jordan might. He'd be sure to call him after this phone call. What about the HR rep at the hospital? Is she involved or was she just following orders? Looks like she was just following orders. Evidently, her marching orders came from someone pretty high up in the department. They're keeping the name quiet for now, but I have a few hunches. I know of a few high-ranking brass who were pretty cozy with Goldman. Anyway, she was persuaded because her boyfriend has had a few DUIs, and this cop assured her he could make them go away. Deacon whistled. What a tangled web we weave indeed. How about the guys who followed us to the warehouse? Ah, yes, those two. Turns out they were college buddies of Goldman's son, hired to try and kidnap Shonda's son in exchange for her silence. Thankfully, it was their first job, and they were too nervous to do it the first day. Deacon looked back toward the living room and shook his head. They had been so lucky. God had definitely been watching out for them. So, is it over? I mean, there's still the possibility of a trial, and if that happens, Shonda may have to come back to testify. But yeah, we're pretty sure we got everyone involved in both the exchange and the cover-up. If she wants to come back now, it's probably safe. Thanks, Eric. I'll let her know. Glad I could help, my friend. Try not to stay such a stranger from now on, huh? You got it. Deacon hung up the phone and chewed on the inside of his lip. All of a sudden, he was conflicted. He knew he'd have to tell Shonda. Though she'd settled into her job and seemed to be relaxing, he knew that she still operated with a cloud of fear over her head, and now he could help alleviate that. But if he told her, would she go back to Baytown? Would he lose Dante? He couldn't think about that right now. One step at a time, and the next step was getting her into a hypnotherapist office to see if she'd been hypnotized. Deacon pulled up Jordan's number on his phone and waited for the detective to answer. Detective Graves here. Jordan, it's Deacon. 
Do you know of any trustworthy hypnotherapists? Hypnotherapists? What for? Deacon filled his friend in on what he knew and waited for his response. Whoa, that's a lot. I feel for your friend, but man, I'm glad I'm not dealing with that here. I don't know of anyone off the top of my head, but let me make some phone calls. Thanks, I appreciate it. You bet. Deacon hung up with Jordan and was about to head back to the living room when something outside the window grabbed his attention. He moved closer and peered out, not believing his eyes. It couldn't be the same man. It just couldn't. The man would have no idea where they were unless he was connected to whoever Shonda called a few nights ago. Was that possible? Dante, I'll be right back, he hollered into the living room before heading out the front door. He was going to find out who this man was once and for all. Hey, who are you? He called as he stepped outside. The man said nothing, but he didn't run either. Hey, I'm talking to you. Who are you and why are you following us? The man simply tilted his head and then tapped his ear as if signaling for Deacon to listen to something. What? What am I supposed to hear? The man held a finger to his lips and then touched his ear again. Though annoyed, Deacon pressed his lips together to listen. At first, he heard nothing. But then the quiet sounds of sirens floated to his ears. As he listened, they grew louder, and a sense of dread filled Deacon's stomach. He didn't know why or how, but he was sure that those sirens meant Shonda was in danger. He was about to ask the man who he was again, but his phone rang. When he recognized Cassidy's number, he answered it. Deacon, is Shonda working today? Yeah, why? What's going on? Luca was listening to the police scanner, and he just heard that shots were fired at the hospital. It's going into lockdown, but the police are on their way. I need to go too, Cassidy, but I can't leave Dante. Can I drop him off on my way? Sure, we'll be happy to watch him, but there's no reason to go, Deacon. They won't let you in. I know, but I have to be there. He knew Cassidy would understand. Not only was she dating Jordan Graves, but she'd been abducted once and knew how hard it had been on Jordan. I get it. Bring him by. We'll make sure he's safe. Deacon thanked her and then hung up the phone. But when he turned back to ask the man more questions, the man was gone. Who was this guy? Knowing there was little time to waste, Deacon ran back inside. Dante, turn off the game. We're going to the firehouse. He didn't tell him the rest because he didn't want to alarm him. Thankfully, Dante didn't ask why. Really? Cool. Deacon tried not to display his concern as he drove to the firehouse. But every minute that ticked by on the clock felt like an hour to him. When they reached the firehouse, it was all he could do to keep from ushering Dante inside alone and then taking off again. Instead, he parked and walked his son inside. Cassidy was waiting at the entrance and gave him a knowing nod. Dante, so good to see you again. Do you want to come help me clean the truck? Do I get to go inside it? Dante asked. You bet. We have to make sure Bubba didn't leave any trash lying around. Hey, I heard that, the large man said as he joined the group. Dante nodded and began to follow Cassidy and Bubba before realizing something was off and turning back. Aren't you coming, Dad? Actually, I need to run a quick errand. Do you think you can stay with Cassidy and Bubba until I return? Dante shrugged. Sure. Then, as if he had no care in the world, he turned back to Cassidy and Bubba. Can we turn the siren on? We'll see, little buddy, Bubba said. Deacon watched them a moment longer before hurrying back to his truck and to the hospital. The cops had the parking lot cordoned off, but he got as close as he could and then approached the cops on foot. Sorry, no one's getting in, the cop said, holding up his hand as Deacon approached. Unfortunately, it was a cop that Deacon didn't recognize, but he decided to try his luck anyway. Please, my girlfriend is a nurse in there. 
and I'm fairly certain that the gunman is after her. The cop lifted an eyebrow. What makes you so sure? Because she witnessed a crime a few weeks ago, and even though it was in another town, the timing is suspicious, don't you think? People witness crimes all the time, the cop said with a shrug. What makes you think the shooter is here for her? Though Deacon was infuriated by the cop's attitude, he reminded himself that this cop didn't know him, didn't know the story, because the crime she witnessed involved Governor Goldman's son. That seemed to get the cop's attention. I can't let you through, but give me your name and description and I'll pass the information along. It wasn't what Deacon had been hoping for, but he figured it would have to do for now. Her name is Shonda Turner, and she works on the pediatric floor. She has dark skin, dark hair. Please, you have to get to her. The cop nodded and relayed the information into the walkie attached to his shoulder. Okay, they know to look out for her. I wish there was more I could do for you, but I'm afraid you'll have to head back to your truck and wait there for information. Deacon sighed and followed the man's order. There had to be something more he could do, but he didn't know what, and he was not good at just waiting. Chapter 22 Shonda Shonda's heart stopped when she heard the gunshots. They had to be looking for her and she knew she had to keep the gunman away from these kids before one of them got hurt in the crossfire. Where are you going? Yolanda asked as Shonda headed for the pediatric entrance. We're safe in here. The doors lock automatically to protect the kids. Shonda shook her head. We're only safe until they realize where I'm at. Once they know that, they'll be shooting out the glass to get to me. I can't let them hurt the kids. You can't know they're after you. It could be something else. Shonda had filled Yolanda in on her story, just in case something like this happened. But she'd hoped nothing would ever come of it. She should have known better. It's too coincidental for it not to be about me. Maybe if I give myself up, they won't hurt anyone else. The thought of heading to the gunfire scared her completely as did the thought of never seeing Dante or Deacon again, but she'd never be able to live with herself if innocent people were killed because of her. She wondered how Deacon did this, headed into danger, and she tried to channel his thoughts as she approached the only thing keeping her safe. Before Yolanda could say anything else, Shonda pushed open the pediatric door, made sure it locked behind her, and then headed toward the lobby where she figured the gunman was. None of the elevators were working, so she was forced to take the stairs, and they felt eerie in the silence. The hospital was usually bustling and noisy, but now it was as if everything had frozen. When she reached the first floor, her heart was pounding, both due to exertion and fear. Shonda had no idea if all the doors locked or only the ones on the pediatric and NICU floor, but she had to try. She tugged on the handle, and the door opened silently. Stepping through, she paused long enough to listen to determine where the shooter might be. Where is Shonda Turner? Shonda blinked at the angry female voice. A woman? She certainly hadn't expected a woman, and why did that voice sound familiar? I've already told you we don't know who you're talking about. Shonda didn't recognize this voice, but she could hear the tremor of fear in it. And I've told you that someone better start talking or I start shooting. Shonda couldn't let that happen. She stepped into the lobby, ready to announce her presence. But as she saw the woman holding the gun, she froze. Marlene? It couldn't be Marlene. Why on earth would she be after Shonda? Marlene? At the sound of her voice, the woman turned toward her, the gun now pointing at Shonda as well. There you are! Nice of you to join us before I had to kill these nice people. 
Vaguely, Shonda registered the group of doctors, nurses, and patients huddled in the corner, but she couldn't focus on them because she was still so shocked at seeing the woman in front of her. What are you doing here? They arrested him, and it's all your fault. Marlene's eyes were wide and wild, and though Shonda still had no idea what was going on, she knew she had to keep the woman talking. Who did they arrest? A snarl distorted Marlene's features. You don't even know? Oh, that's rich. Benny gets thrown in jail and you get to prance around scot-free? I'm sorry, who is Benny? Shonda was trying to follow along, but she had no idea who Marlene was talking about. And from the crazed look in her eyes, Shonda wasn't sure Marlene did either. She had always seemed so kind at the therapist's office. But now Shonda wondered if perhaps she was the one who should have been at the appointments. Who's Benny? A strangled laugh escaped her throat, and she turned back toward the group she had been addressing earlier. Do you hear that? She got him thrown in jail, and she doesn't even know who he is. She turned back to Shonda. Benny Goldman, the governor's son, is that ringing a bell for you? Shonda hadn't even known the governor had a son. She didn't pay close attention to politics. But that would make sense. The governor was up for re-election later this year, and he wouldn't want the public to know his son had a drug problem. Benny was the guy I saw do the fentanyl exchange, wasn't he? Shonda asked. Exchange? You make it sound like he's some sort of career drug dealer. He'd only done a few, and that was his last one. He was doing it to save up enough money that we could get married. Then he was going to stop, but you had to go and ruin it. Through the windows behind Marlene, Shonda saw the cops approaching. She didn't know what their plan was, but perhaps she could keep Marlene talking and distracted. Why did he need to save money? Isn't the governor wealthy? Marlene sneered. Yeah, the governor is. But he didn't approve of me, so he wouldn't give Benny the money. Of course, once you went to the police, he realized I could be an asset. I don't understand. How could you be an asset? Because I worked for Dr. Nelson, and I knew that not only was he related to the Goldmans, but he had racked up a substantial debt from gambling. I'm the one who suggested he pressure your job to force you to attend therapy. Dr. Nelson isn't good for much, but I knew that I could hypnotize you and make you more susceptible to his therapy. You're the one who hypnotized me? Marlene shrugged. I learned how in high school and got pretty good at it. I figured it was worth a shot. If we could make you either forget what you'd seen or at least question it, then we could make the whole thing go away. And it would have worked, too, if that man hadn't shown up with you. I took one look at him and knew he was trouble. Shonda shook her head. Deacon came because I called him. I knew something was off with Dr. Nelson. I just didn't know what. Marlene scowled and spat out a string of curse words. I should have known he would get sloppy and mess it up. He breaks everything he touches. Shonda saw the first police officer appear behind Marlene and knew she just needed to keep her talking a little longer. Who did I call the other night? Was that you or Dr. Nelson? That was me. The first thing I programmed you to do was call and tell me your location if you missed an appointment. That way, if you had gotten suspicious, I could come and take care of things, which is what I'm doing now. Drop the gun, the police officer said. And while Marlene turned to him, Shonda ran and hid behind a desk. No, you drop your gun and leave, or I'll start shooting people, Marlene said and pointed her gun at the group she'd been threatening before. I wouldn't do that if I were you, another cop said, this one from behind Shonda. Shonda couldn't see everything from her hiding place, 
But she could see Marlene and the resigned expression on her face when she realized she had no way out. She hesitated a moment longer, but finally she sighed and dropped the gun. The police swarmed forward and took Marlene into custody. Only when her hands were cuffed did Shonda come out from behind the desk. One of the officers stepped toward her. Are you Shonda Turner? Shonda blinked at the officer, surprised he knew her name. She certainly didn't recognize him. I am. Why? I was told to look for you and make sure you were safe. Evidently, you have someone outside very worried about your safety. Deacon? Was Deacon here? But how would he have known? Is it Deacon Jackson? Can I go see him? I can't let you leave yet until we ask you some questions, but as soon as we secure the building, I can bring him in. Thank you. Do you know if my son is with him? The officer shook his head. I wasn't told about a kid, so I don't think so. Shonda wondered what Deacon had done with Dante if he wasn't with him. Surely he wouldn't have left the boy home alone. He was only eight and in an unfamiliar town. Maybe he'd called a friend or taken Dante to the firehouse. That still unnerved her a little because she didn't know those people well, but she trusted Deacon and he trusted them. The officer led her into an examination room. Wait here and someone will be in to take your statement. I'll get your friend in as soon as I can. Shonda thanked him and sat down in the chair. She wondered if this meant that it was finally over. If Benny had been the one she'd seen and he was in jail, could she finally stop looking behind her and jumping at shadows? But she didn't get to consider the question long before a different officer stepped in and asked to take her statement. Shonda answered each question as honestly as she could, and before the interview was finished, a knock sounded at the door. It opened and Deacon's head appeared. Is it okay if I come in? He asked. The officer nodded. I think we're about done here anyway, so feel free. Deacon sat down next to her, and it was all Shonda could do not to melt into his arms. After a few more questions, the officer excused himself, and Shonda turned to Deacon. What are you doing here? How did you even know? And where is Dante? Deacon took her hands. Dante is fine. He's at the firehouse with Cassidy and Bubba. And as for how I knew, I'm not sure you'll believe me. Try me. Well, I got a call from Eric that Dr. Nelson and Benny Goldman were arrested. He thought that was the end of it. But as I hung up the phone, I saw a man out my window. It was the same man I'd seen in Baytown several times. The same man who led us out of the warehouse. And when I went to ask him who he was and why he was there, he motioned for me to listen. Once I heard the sirens, I knew you were in trouble. And then Cassidy called and said she'd heard about the shooter over the police scanner. I dropped Dante off at the firehouse and then rushed over here. What happened to the man? Shonda asked. Who is he? Deacon shook his head. I don't know. When I hung up with Cassidy, the man was gone. Gone? Where did he go? Not sure of that either. He has a habit of disappearing every time I see him. I don't even know his name. Deacon's brow furrowed. I'm not sure I've ever even heard him speak. Shonda didn't know what to make of that, but she was grateful that Deacon had come, that he was here with her. Is it done then? Finally over? I think so. He squeezed her hands and chewed on his bottom lip. I know we haven't really talked about it much, but will you stay? I don't think I could lose you and Dante again. The same question had been running through her mind. She'd only been at her job a few days, but she did like it here. The HR department was definitely nicer, and so far she liked her co-workers. Plus, what was there to go back to, really? Nothing but her house and bad memories. She looked back at Deacon and smiled. I really think I want to stay. Chapter 23 Deacon You ready for this? Deacon asked as they pulled up to Shonda's house in Baytown. 
She'd received word just a few days ago that the house had sold, and Deacon had rented a truck so they could pack up the things she wanted to take back to Fire Beach. Thankfully, Cassidy had offered to watch Dante, and Eric and Tim had agreed to join them later in the afternoon to help with the furniture pieces that Shonda wanted to keep. She'd been looking at apartments to rent, but with no furniture to move in with, she'd waited. Shonda took a deep breath. Yeah, I guess so. As ready as I'll ever be. Deacon turned off the truck, grabbed a stack of boxes from the back of the truck, and followed Shonda into the house. Where do you want to start? He asked, surveying the room. It was daunting when he looked around the living room at the book and picture frames, but he realized her living room wasn't as full as his own. In fact, all things considered, it was pretty sparse for someone who had been living here for years. I guess in here, or at least you can start in here and I'll take the kitchen. All of this will go. Okay. He handed her a few boxes and then got to work on packing the books and wrapping the few candle holders and ceramic trinkets she had, as well as the photographs. But when he reached the top shelf, he froze. It couldn't be. He brought the frame closer to his face, but he was sure it was the same man. Shonda, can you come here a second? A moment later, she was by his side, her brow furrowed in question. What is it? Who is this man? He held out the photograph for her to see. That's my dad. Why? Deacon shook his head. It wasn't possible. This is the guy who I kept seeing. The one who told me about the shooter. The one who led us out of the warehouse. The one who was in the therapist's office that day. Wait, there was no one in the therapist's office the day you came with me, Shonda said, interrupting him. Yes, there was. A man in the corner with a hoodie on. I wondered why he wasn't being called first, but figured he must have just finished and was waiting for a ride. Shonda shook her head slowly. I suppose I could have missed a guy in the corner, though I don't think so. But this couldn't have been the guy you saw. My dad passed away three years ago. Deacon looked back at the picture, but he was certain. More certain than he'd been about anything in a while. Shonda, the man I saw never spoke, and he always seemed to vanish into thin air. Do you think maybe God sent a guardian angel to protect us? I mean, I don't think I've ever seen an angel, but I believe they exist. Why would the angel look like my dad, though? Shonda asked. Maybe to serve two purposes. The first was to save us, but maybe he looked like your dad for this moment right here. What do you mean? Deacon took a deep breath. Since the moment you called me, I haven't been able to get that night out of my head, the night we broke up. I've been praying to God to help me know if we're supposed to rekindle this. This? He held out the picture. This makes me sure, Shonda. I don't think it was an accident that the angel looked like your father. I think it was a sign to me, an answer to my prayer. Okay, I don't know enough about how angels work to agree or argue with you, but if it was an answer to your prayer, what does that mean now? It means... Deacon paused, because while he was convinced this was the right path, he didn't have the right stuff with him. He hadn't bought a ring yet. He hadn't planned the perfect proposal. But did that matter? It means that I think you shouldn't move out. She folded her arms across her chest and shook her head. Deacon, we talked about this. I can't keep sharing a room with Dante, and I won't share a room with you unless we're married. Deacon set down the photograph and took her hands. That's what I mean. Let's get married. What? You can't be serious. We've only been dating for a month. This time, but eight years ago, we had been together for over a year. I had always planned to propose to you, and I believe you had planned to say yes. Yes, but... No buts, he said, interrupting her. I haven't loved anyone since you, and now Dante's in the picture. Don't you see? 
This is God fixing what we broke so long ago. He wants relationships restored, and he's giving us a second chance. I understand that, but that doesn't mean we have to jump into it. What are we jumping into? We're simply picking up where we left off eight years ago. You're serious. I am. Look, we can even move into a bigger house if that's what you want, but let's not waste any more time apart. She stared at him a moment longer before breaking into a smile. Okay, it's crazy and spontaneous, but let's do it. Deacon was about to pick her up and twirl her around, but she continued. On one condition. He couldn't imagine what kind of condition she could place on the arrangement, but he would do just about anything. What's that? A flush of embarrassment covered her cheeks, and her eyes shifted to the side. This will hopefully be my only marriage, and I know it sounds silly, but could you do a proper proposal with a ring and a question? Deacon laughed and pulled her closer. Is that all? Shonda nodded. It's stupid, I know, but one day I'd like to tell our kids about the proposal, and while this story is amazing, it would be an awfully long one to tell. Deacon tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. Don't you worry, I'll do the proposal right. Then her words registered in his brain and he froze. Wait, did you say kids, as in plural? Another round of pink flashed across her cheeks. Well, yeah. Dante's always wanted a sibling, and you and I always talked about four or five. I didn't figure you were opposed. Oh, I'm not. I definitely am not. He'd missed all of Dante's firsts, and even though he'd told himself it didn't matter because he was there now, and he never planned on leaving again, he could not help the excitement that raced through his bones at the thought of getting to be there for the next one. He stared down at Shonda and pulled her even closer. I love you, Shonda Turner. She smiled up at him. And I love you, Deacon Jackson. Though there was still work to be done, Deacon allowed himself to get lost in her lips for a moment. And this time, the kiss held a promise of forever. Epilogue. Shonda. Shonda stared down at the ring on her finger and sighed. Deacon had definitely outdone himself with the proposal. He'd asked his friends at the fire station to watch Dante and then filled the house with flower petals leading to a romantic dinner he'd cooked. To say it had been perfect was an understatement. She looked back up at herself in the mirror still unable to believe this was finally happening. It was everything she had hoped for eight years ago, and the only thing that would have made it better would have been if her parents could have been here. But she knew they were watching down on this moment and rejoicing. You look amazing, Yolanda said, appearing behind her in the mirror. Yolanda had become her closest friend here in Fire Beach, and it was only natural that she should also be her maid of honor. In addition, Shonda had asked Cassidy and Ivy, partly because they were such a big part of Deacon's life, and partly because they'd been so kind and helpful when it came to watching Dante, when those needs arose. Her list of friends was still pretty small, but she was looking forward to seeing it grow as she spent more time here. Thank you for helping me find a dress on such short notice, Shonda said, turning to embrace her friend. When Yolanda had seen the ring on Shonda's finger, she'd done three things. First, she'd squealed in excitement. Second, she'd demanded the whole story. And third, she'd explained that her sister owned a bridal shop and she would have the perfect dress for Shonda. Though she'd been sure she would never be able to afford it, Yolanda's sister's boutique had contained the perfect dress, and it had been on sale. Yolanda rolled her eyes good-naturedly. Girl, you should have known I would not let you get married in anything but the best, but I'm certainly glad Candida was able to help you. 
The door opened then, and Cassidy stuck her head in. Shonda had asked her and Ivy to make sure everything was remaining on time and as planned. If you're ready, the rest of the church is as well. Shonda took a deep breath and nodded. This was it. The moment she'd thought would happen nearly a decade ago. Is Dante ready too? Cassidy smiled and nodded. Yep, Luca's been watching him. He looks very dapper, like a regular young gentleman. Shonda had no doubt. Yolanda's sister had taken care of getting him a little suit as well. Okay, then I guess I'm ready. She handed Cassidy and Ivy their bouquets, checked her appearance one more time in the mirror, and then followed the women down the hall to the sanctuary. She'd only been attending this church with Deacon for the last month or so, but it felt like home, and she couldn't imagine getting married anywhere else. Bubba, Luca, and Jordan waited outside the doors with Dante, but he broke ranks as soon as he saw her. Wow, Mom, you look so pretty, he said, giving her a hug. He pulled back, grinned up at her, and patted his pocket. I've been doing a great job keeping the ring safe. You be proud of me. I'm sure you have been, and I'm very proud of you. He'd refused to carry the normal pillow. Shonda couldn't really blame him, but he'd agreed to keep the rings in his pocket. Everybody ready? Jordan asked opening the door a crack and peering inside. Absolutely, Shonda said. Dante hurried back to the doors, and when Jordan opened them completely, he began his trek down the aisle. Jordan and Cassidy followed next, then Ivy and Bubba, and finally Yolanda and Luca. Shonda closed her eyes for a moment and thought about her parents. She wished her father were here to walk her down the aisle, and that her mom had been here to help her plan everything. But though they weren't here physically, she felt their presence and tried to hold on to the last memory she had of hugging her father. Then the music changed, and she was walking down the aisle. Though everything felt surreal, she couldn't help noticing the red flower petals sprinkled on the aisle, and it brought Deacon's proposal to mind. He'd arranged for Dante to hang out at the fire station for a few hours, and then he'd filled his house with rose petals, leading from the door to the kitchen. He'd set up a candlelit table and prepared her favorite meal, but he'd been waiting on bended knee as she entered. She'd had no idea how long he'd been in that position, but her heart had warmed at the sight. She felt a similar sensation now as she walked toward him. When she reached the altar, she passed her bouquet to Yolanda and took his hands. The pastor began speaking, but Shonda couldn't concentrate on his words. All she could focus on were the warm pools of chocolate that were Deacon's eyes. Somehow, she managed to repeat the vows and say I do, and then the pastor was pronouncing them man and wife, and Deacon's lips were on hers. Joy, like she'd never known, shot through her, And then she and Deacon were hurrying back down the aisle and out the doors of the sanctuary. I can't believe we made it, Shonda said. She'd been so sure that something would keep this wedding from happening, but they'd managed to make it all the way through the ceremony. Me either, Deacon said, wrapping his arms around her waist and pulling her close. But I'm certainly glad we did. He began to nuzzle her neck. And while she wanted to succumb to the feelings, there was still a reception to be held, and the rest of the people would be exiting the sanctuary soon. This was not the time or the place, but she was definitely looking forward to tonight, and sharing a bed with Deacon instead of her son. The doors behind them opened, and Shonda expected to see the wedding party emerge. Instead, it was Jordan his partner Al, and a few other detectives she didn't know well. All of them had lost their smiles and instead looked as if they'd been chiseled out of stone. Beside her, Deacon stiffened as he noticed them as well. Jordan, is everything okay? Jordan shook his head. I hate to duck out on you, but we just got a call about a missing person. Missing person? Shonda asked. Jordan nodded and turned to her. Evidently it's your boss, Dr. Garrett Young. 
What? When? He shook his head. We don't know much, only that he didn't show up for work today and he's not answering his phone. But I'll contact you when I can. I'm sorry we have to run, but please don't let this ruin your day. Shonda knew he was right, but she felt so helpless doing nothing. Hey, Deacon said, tugging on her hand to get her to look at him. They've got this, and we've got a reception to attend. We can't do much to help physically, but we can pray for him, and we can do it without ceasing. Shonda nodded and smiled up at him. It might have taken eight years longer than she'd planned, but there was no one she would rather have by her side than Deacon Jackson. She just hoped that praying would be enough. The End Want to find out what's happened to Dr. Young? Be sure to pre-order In the Dark of Night. This has been In the Light of Day, a Men of Fire Beach Romantic Suspense, written by Lorena Hoops, copyright 2023. Narrated by Lorena Hoops, audio copyright 2023.